Tick tock, time to rock. Good evening, good morning, good afternoon to everyone who's watching from all over the world. I'm your friendly neighborhood philosopher, David Wood. And with me now, as is often the case, I have the Assyrian Encyclopedia sure. with me. Sam Shamoon, how you doing, Sam? Oh, surviving by the grace of Jesus Christ. Appreciate your prayers, that they pray for us, that the Lord Jesus cleanse us in his holy blood, make us pure and fill us with the Spirit in Jesus' name. Good evening, good morning, good afternoon. Okay, yeah, I see, you can hear. Nope, nope, that's, that's actually me this time. My fault. Oh, man. It even happens that no matter how many live streams I do, sometimes I'll have the live stream pulled up and actually forget to push the audio, which is funny because if you'd done it, I'd be heaping abuse on you now telling you what a loser you are. Right, no, I'm about to say that too. So guys, just pray that the Lord Jesus will be glorified through us and wash us in the precious blood of the Lamb, the Lord Jesus, and help us to uh, deal with this young man. We have a young man with us, so by the grace of God, in Jesus' name, And with us also, we have Hamdullah, and uh, he, we invited people um, over a week ago. We said we we're going to have a Muhammad week. I'm starting to hear an echo now. Um, That's probably on his end now. It's on his end. Yeah, check, you check. Gotta, yeah, it's it's probably on his end. It's if he's on YouTube, just silence his computer. Ask him. Yeah, it's not. Well, uh, we'll just. Um, hmm. Yeah, we'll try to not be talking over one another so that we can uh, we can mute things when we need to mute them and so on. But uh, we said that we we're going to have a Muhammad week where we would invite Muslims to come on and join us, and that uh, Muslims could come on and defend Muhammad, defend their prophet, explain to us why Muhammad's a true prophet, and so on. And uh, we've gotten a number of people who've wanted to join us live, and Hamdullah is one of the Muslims who wanted to join us. And he said he'd like to explain uh, basically two things. So one, he wants to explain why uh, he has concluded in, in his life that Muhammad is, is the option for him. Uh, so basically a little uh, sort of biographical story. And second, he wants to explain why we should believe that Muhammad's a prophet. So he wants to lay out some reasons for believing in Muhammad. So first of all, uh, Alhamdulillah, how are you doing? Um, hey, David. Um, uh, I'm fine. Um, hello, uh, hello, Sam. <laughs> how you doing? Yeah. Can I just, before you say something, I just want to, just so real quickly, want to say, you guys need to show a lot of love and respect for these young Muslim men who are coming on the channel and willing to defend what they believe because we've had a standing challenge to the Muslim scholars and apologists. These grown men who have YouTube channels and claim to be apologists to debate Christians and others on the true claims of Islam, not one of them accepted our challenge. And I'm talking about Shibrali, Zakir Naik, even Ijaz Ahmed, Hamza, all of them. And yet here these young men show more courage, they're probably 19, 20, 21, more courage for their conviction and their faith in Allah and His Messenger and come online to answer difficult questions. So you have to have nothing but love and respect for these young men and pray for them. I am so disappointed in these so-called Muslim apologists and scholars, EF Dawa, SC Dawa, Adnan Rashid, the cowards wouldn't come, but young men like him come, so you have my respect. To it and, and and Sam, we've both noticed that these, you know, the the, the younger the younger Muslims, the Muslims in their their late teens or, or early twenties, they seem to have much more respectful conversations than some of the older Muslims, right? Like like you, you can get a you know sixty year old Muslim on there and he'll want to start shouting shouting you down and stuff, whereas some of the younger Muslims actually have friendlier conversations, which. I would have expected that to be the reverse. You know what I mean? I expect young people to be more more aggressive and and more shouting and stuff like that. But a, a, a lot, the the young Muslims we've had on this week have been uh, very respectful and very very courageous to uh, to join us. Uh, all right. Uh, so, Hamdullah, if you want to, we're, we're not gonna we're not gonna interrupt you for yes, if you want to take I'm five myself. if you want to take five to ten minutes or so to uh, share your your background, your story of of why you believe in Muhammad. The the time is yours, sir. Um, thank you very much. <clears throat> um, uh, like everyone knows that um, there's a, uh, you know, in uh, Pakistan and all the other countries, there are many uh, Christian and Muslim homes which uh, take religion to a more um, cultural side than a spiritual side. And therefore, people do go to the mosques, people do go to the churches, but there's not a, a relationship with God that's developed. 
uh, therefore there's a part in um, every person's life um, where uh, the person has a lot of um, questions from god and has a lot of um, things he wants to know there's a lot of um, holes that aren't uh, filled and therefore we all um, go and search for the truth and so i started uh, i i was i think it was a, i just had a deistic feeling that there might be a higher authority but i didn't know how much it was active in our uh, lives um, therefore um, but i slowly started uh, moving on towards um, religions so before um, learning about muhammad I assalamu alaikum salam may peace be upon him I learned about Jesus Christ um I learned about how he healed people I learned about how he was um there to save people um I'm very sorry uh, if I like criticize him or anything that's just my uh, point of view you are welcome to refute me which you're going to do so um what happened was that um i found him a, uh, as a very interesting and as a very kind as a very merciful person but after that when i started to look into the um, ideology or the doctrine of um, the trinity like most um, christians even find it it was quite um, confusing and um, moreover because we were all taught about the grand sacrifice and then we were all taught about how only the human nature died of god's so service like that's not a grand sacrifice if the human nature died only i i mean there might be uh, there must be an explanation for it but because god can't die and if jesus did die that was his human um side and and i was like that can be the great sacrifice so i so i then basically my family has a background um of um uh, Um, being muslims but uh, i think besides my mother nobody's um that uh, practicing so i started to look into um islam and obviously when you uh, want to know if a prophet is um true or not you look uh, you look at their story you look at um how genuine the story is so when i first uh, learned about muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam may peace be upon him i found to you know that um even though in such a cruel environment even though at the time uh, when daughters were buried in the ground um even though at the times where there were wars and there were um, fights over small things and people would drink alcohol and do all sorts of bad things um there was this one person um uh, who didn't used to do that and um even after he accepted islam um there were um and uh, before god gave him uh, the um revelation to fight he um, didn't start fighting now obviously i think uh, it's a must for us to say that jesus christ performed miracles because as muslims we have to um believe in that that god gave him miracles but you guys don't believe in miracles but uh if i just give you an an analogy that if uh, i mean we do say that prophet muhammad had miracles he went to the miraj he uh, there was milk pouring out of his um sorry water pouring out of his um fingers uh, there was a time when a, a meal uh, when he was starting to eat it he somehow knew that there was poison in it and he survived that now obviously if you um ask for proof for these miracles i'm i'm not going to give you any proof for these miracles because at the same time a person another person can ask you to show uh, us the healed person which jesus christ healed but that was because god gave him these miracles so we believe that prophet muhammad also had these miracles and uh, and another and the two last reasons were i mean there are a lot of reasons but i thought of why not giving other reasons um so i thought that uh, prophet muhammad had about um, more than 50 scribes or so i think there are a lot i don't remember the exact number so i was thinking that if there is such a big group and he is claiming to receive a revelation from god uh, in front of 
so many people and therefore even if we say that he's illiterate he was illiterate so we said that it's not physically or techni uh, technically possible that he could have written the entire book by himself because he was not able to read other books even if he had heard stories it was not possible for him to write uh, a 30 um, chapter long book so even if we say that um, some people gathered and wrote the book um, I just wanted to ask that m maybe one or two people in the in such a large group could have simply um, went out and said that no this is they're faking it they're writing a book themselves so I think because they say that um, three uh, the only way three uh, robbers can't keep a uh, can keep a cigarette if two aren't there so if so many people believed in his miracles and if so many people um, saw him and all of what he was doing I think it's pretty reliable and also um, God never lets false prophets or false liars to succeed I mean they always have a downfall and as you can see that the people who were really God's prophets and who were really successful um, uh, were actually people who God had sent for example, Jesus Christ himself, when he was dying, he didn't have so many supporters. But after, uh, uh, sorry, he didn't die. He was, uh, sorry, when, um, he, uh, I mean, when he went to the heavens, he, he was not over here in the physical world. So we believe that. So what happened after that is many followers started following him. The same way with other prophets, they faced many difficulties in their life. But after that, God's kingdom was established. Um, I think that's pretty much from me. All right. Thank you. Um, thank you, Hamdullah. And so I, I guess we can just kind of go through these points uh, one at a time. And either I can respond or Sam can respond. We'll, we'll, we'll share our thoughts on this and then... Uh, you can share more of your thoughts. So, Sam, uh, Alhamdulillah mm -hmm. started with uh, some points about the doctrine of the Trinity. It's confusing. Mm -hmm. And then with the uh, death of Jesus, with the death of Jesus, since Jesus isn't God, that would mean that only his his body died. Just just for a yeah. clarification on theology, because you study theology a lot more than, uh, than I have, Sam. Um, I don't know about that. Uh, you're philosophically very sophisticated. So, right, but anyway, go ahead. Yeah. That's yeah. Ph that's philosophy. Yes, philosophy. I would school you. But it helps you. with theology. Yeah. Mm -hmm. philosophy that's true. That's true. Theology. That's so, on, on on that issue, uh, sometimes sometimes I don't always do a good job of breaking this down. But it's the it's the dual nature Jesus who died on the cross, right? So that's it's it's Jesus who has a dual nature. When we say that his divine nature didn't die, it's not that the dual the dual nature Jesus didn't experience death. We're talking about death as sort of some sort of ceasing to exist or ceasing to function yes, or something like that, which yeah. we we say his divine nature didn't. But uh, how would you respond to? I guess there are a couple of points here. One. Uh, on the doctrine of the Trinity, should we be suspicious of it because it's confusing, or should we be suspicious of the death of Jesus because it doesn't make sense? And and, and second, uh, one thing that I find few Muslims consider is if they start probing their own theology, they run into all kinds of issues that uh, I would say at least, or at least as as <laughs> if, they, if they're confused by the doctrine of the Trinity, you can find all sorts of things in Islamic theology that would be every bit as confusing, and so. The point is, mm -hmm. if you're if you're if you take this path consistently and say, well, the doctrine of the Trinity doesn't make sense, so I'm going to go, I'm going to look for something else, then you should become some sort of agnostic or some sort of generic theist, not not a Muslim, mm -hmm. because if you look into Islamic theology, you're going to run into some some you're going to run into some conf very confusing things. So if you, that's your objection, that's not my objection. If if I have evidence that a position is true, if I if I have evidence that uh, you know, Einstein's general theory of relativity is correct. Doesn't matter if it's confusing to me. If it's true, then 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 it's true. But if you're going to say, "Hey, it's confusing," therefore I reject it, then you're going to run into some problems. So, what are your thoughts on on all of this? On all of these? Yeah, I I'm, I'm assuming he's probably heard some Muslims bring up these objections because, to be honest, they're very bad objections. And if he spends enough time just watching your videos, my videos, or Anthony Rogers, or reading our stuff, he'd have answers to these, because even when he asked the question, 
you know, how can God die? And he said, cease to be, <clears throat> cease to exist. So, alhamdulillah, you have your Quran with you? Can you hear me? Is he there? Yeah, yeah I, I do have my mobile. I'll just uh, search up the verse. You open up Surah Al-Baqarah, chapter 2, verse 154, if you can. Have it up. I know your rooster is up early in the morning. He's, he's probably, everything submits to Allah the Quran says. So he's probably doing uh, salah. Chapter but anyway, two verse. chapter 2. Chapter 2, Surah Al-Baqarah, chapter 2, verse 154. Yeah. Poor rooster. I don't know what he's going to sound. When you get there, let me know. Are you there? That's what roosters do, man. That's a, if you, yeah, Sam, right. if, you, Sam if, you'd, if you'd grown up in West Virginia like me, or, Virginia. or with, with, with Hamdullah, you, you'd know what, uh, what chickens and roosters yeah. sound like. Yeah, right. But, uh, so are you there, my friend? Did you get there? Yeah, yeah. Okay, read for me chapter 2, verse 154. Read it for me. And do not say about those who are killed in the way of Allah, they are dead, rather they are alive, but you perceive it not. Okay, so when someone is killed, he's still alive. He doesn't cease to exist. Can you go to chapter 3 of the Quran, Surah Al-Imran, chapter 3? When you get there, let me know. And now I'll read the Bible. So you can read the Quran, I'll read the Bible. Chapter okay, 3 of the Quran, Surah Imran, Ayah 169 to 170. If you can read it. Okay. Yeah, you get there. Yeah. Read it for us. And never think of those who have been killed in the cause of Allah as dead, rather they are alive with their Lord. Receiving provision. Do I, do I need to give an explanation about that? No, you need to read to 170. 169, 170. 169, 170. Okay. Yeah. 169, 170. Yeah. Um, rejoicing in what Allah has bestowed upon them of His bounty, and they receive good tidings about those to be martyred. Uh, after them who have not yet joined them, that there will be no fear concerning them, nor will they grieve. Okay, now, in these two verses of the Quran, when someone dies, killed, he's still alive. And it says, do not say they're dead. And even in Islamic tradition, in your hadith, when a person dies, they are alive in their grave. They are alive in the barzakh. So, your definition of death, that if Jesus is God, he died. How can God die? If it's only the human nature, then it's not this great value. You're giving the wrong definition of death. Death doesn't mean when you die, you cease to exist. That's not the definition of your Quran or Hadith, and it's not the definition of the Bible. So I'm now going to read to you the verses of the Bible. What did Jesus say? John 2, 19 and 22. John 2, I'm going to read it, 19 and 22. Jesus answered them, destroy this temple. I will raise it again in three days. I will raise it again in three days. They replied, it has taken 46 years to build the temple, and you are going to raise it in three days? But the temple he had spoken of was his body. After he was raised from the dead, his disciples recalled what he had said. Then they believed the scripture and the words that Jesus had spoken. So Jesus says, when you destroy the temple, my body, I will raise my body in three days. And he confirms this. In John chapter 10, verses 17 to 18, John chapter 10, verses 17 to 18, the reason my father loves me is that I lay down my life only to take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have authority to lay it down and authority to take it up again. This command I received from my father. So Jesus says, no one can kill me if I didn't allow it to happen, and then I will take my life back again in three days so jesus was still alive conscious and in control because you cannot raise your body in three days if you cease to exist so why did you give the wrong definition of death do i answer yes yes no? yeah okay um i'm very sorry if you misheard me uh, sam Basically, what I was trying to say is that uh, when I said that um, he died, after that I corrected myself. I said that in the Muslim um, ideology, we say that Jesus was shown um, 
that he died but he was physically taken up to the heavens by allah and just a uh, clarification you said that a martyr goes and lives at barzakh basically every soul that dies in this world till the day of judgment we believe that it will live at barzakh so i think not only the martyrs and what allah is talking over here is he saying that they are alive with we know that christian and muslims both believe in an afterlife so in that context we're saying all that no if you remember earlier when you began you said about the trinity and jesus dying how can he die if he's god if it's just his human nature then it's not a great sacrifice and if it's god who died how can he cease to exist that was what, how you started so i'm addressing you who said that Jesus, the God-man, when he died, he ceased to exist? No, I, I just said that the Christians say that there's a great sacrifice. Mm -hmm. So I was saying that if they say that the divine nature can die and the phys and the human nature of Jesus uh, died, so I think so. I was saying that um, on the cross. So I was saying that how can that? Um, be a great sacrifice if um, that's only human nature. So when I answered, what do you mean divine human natures can't die? Persons die. Okay, when you die as a man, your human nature is dead, but you said you're still alive. So what do you mean dead? So what I meant dead was that, for example, if I, uh, like uh, in Islam, we believe that at the day of judgment, um, in the end, God will kill all the um uh, angels, um, for example, Jibrail and all the uh, main uh, holy uh, angels, so die like that, that they completely cease to exist in the um, afterworld. Um, and in that's in the world. future, right? That's in the future. We're yeah, not talking about saying... what you believe in the future. We're talking about now when someone dies, when your prophet died, he ceased to exist or is he alive in Barzakh? You just said they're alive in Barzakh, right? Yeah. Yeah. So then, again, let's go back. Don't tell me about the future, about when every soul will taste death, because that also would imply that your God has to die. But I'll get to that later. Let's take it step by step. We're talking now. When someone dies now, are they still alive? Mm, they are alive, but not in this world. Okay, so they're still alive, though. It, I everyone didn't, I didn't has an afterlife. No, I yes, say yes. They're, 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 in the they're in the Barzakh. They're in the so now my question to you, so we can get this out of the way and go to the other points. When Jesus says, destroy this body, I will raise it up. Who raises the dead from their graves, according to Islam? It's God. Okay, but Jesus says, I'm going to raise my body up in three days. How can Jesus do that? With the help of the Father. Okay, even with the help of the Father. So you're admitting that when Jesus' physical body is in the grave, Jesus was still alive, and with the Father being still alive, he raised his body to life. So where's the problem? No, no, no. I, I, no, I didn't say that. that. No, no. No, I'm saying you, that. That's what Jesus yeah, yeah. said. John yeah. 2. You said, that how is it, you said how is it physical, uh, how is it possible that a person can be alive? I said that every God can do everything, but obviously we don't believe in that. Uh, in the Quran, we say that uh, it was only shown that he died. No, that's, your, that's a different yeah. subject. You change the subject. Yeah. Let's stick to yeah. what you said, brother. I don't know if you're following your own argument. You began, I'm going to repeat it. You said that Jesus, you had a problem with the Trinity because if Jesus is the God man and Christians say it's a great sacrifice and only his human nature died, how can it be a great sacrifice? Because God can't cease to exist. So now we corrected that. Jesus, the God man died, but he was still alive because death doesn't mean you stop existing, right? Right now, don't tell me about the future when the, uh, Allah wipes out everything, every soul, right? Yeah, but uh, okay. the question still remains that where is the great sacrifice then? Because See, the God man died, back. the person who died, that person, he's infinite in value. It's the person that makes the sacrifice valuable or not. Since the person is God, by experiencing that, he as a person is infinite in value. So it makes the sacrifice great because it's the person of the son and as the son of god that person is infinite in value there's no problem if you want we can move on to something else ma'am um, we can because obviously like i said that you have your uh, own point of view but like i said that uh, i mean personally i wouldn't consider a three-day um 
a person being uh, dead for three days and then I would consider it a great sacrifice. But obviously, we all have... time with value. It doesn't matter how long you're dead. That doesn't make something more valuable or less valuable. Stop confusing time with value. The time has no indication of the value of the person. The value of the person is what makes the sacrifice great or not so great, not the time. Time has nothing to do with it. But before we give, okay, that's we we spend a lot of time on that. Now, before I go to the next point, David, do you want to say something? Because I don't want to keep hogging the conversation. I just wanted to give you a a, a question from the chat real quick. That's kind of uh, that that kind of leads into the issue of the deity of Christ and so on. But uh, uh, it's just a common okay. one that that keeps coming up. Uh, Kay Azim said there was a lot of prophecies about the incoming incidents. But why Old Testament missed the prophecy about God going to come in flesh? So he's saying, hey, the Old Testament contains all kinds of prophecies about things that are happening in the future. But why, Sam, why did the Old Testament completely miss God coming in the flesh? Okay, now, if I show him, I want him, I'm hoping he's listening because I'm going to show him several prophecies. If I show him that the, the Old Testament does say, God will come in the flesh. God will become a man, will be born as a human being. Will he now admit that Christianity is true because the Old Testament confirms God will become human being and that God who became human is Jesus. So that means all the New Testament agree, contradicting the Quran. Will he stop becoming a Muslim? Because I'm going to show him the prophecies. So that's my challenge to him. I hope he's listening. So now let me give you the prophecies because that's what he wanted. Okay, let's go. Let me just get a translation where everyone can understand. Hold on, let me get it. Sorry, man. Too many translations out there, but that's okay. That's English translations. It's not too many Arabic Kirat, but that's another story. Here you go. Isaiah chapter 9. The Muslim who asked me the question. Isaiah chapter 9, verses 6 to 7. I'm going to read it slowly because I want everyone to hear this. For unto us a child is born. So this is human baby. Child born. Yelid Yulet is the Hebrew. Unto us a son is given. And the government will be on his shoulder, and his name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God. In the Hebrew, it's El Gibor. If I were to translate this in Arabic, Arabic would be Ilah El Jabbar. Or you can even say Allah El Jabbar. So the child born, his name is Ilah Allah El Jabbar. Mighty God, El Gibor, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace, there will be no end. Upon the throne of David and over his kingdom, to order it and establish it with judgment and justice. From that time forward, even forever, the zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. So here's a child born, and he is El Gibor, God the Mighty, which in Arabic would be Ilah El Jabbar, one of the names of Allah, El Jabbar. And again, to prove to my Muslim friend who asked that question, that this is the name of the true God. In Isaiah 10, verse 21, the next chapter, Isaiah 10, verse 21, it says, A remnant shall return, a remnant shall return to the mighty God. There, the God of Israel is called mighty God. So that's one prophecy. Child born, a human baby, who's the mighty God. Second prophecy, Jeremiah 20, 23, Jeremiah 23 Verses 5 to 6, second prophecy for my Muslim friend, Jeremiah 23, verses 5 to 6. Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, that I will raise to David a branch of righteousness. Now notice the connection with Isaiah 9. In Isaiah 9, the child born, who's the mighty God, sits on the throne of David. That was Isaiah 9, 6 to 7. So it's the same child who sits on the throne of David in Jeremiah, this righteous branch branch of righteousness that god will raise from david the king a king shall reign and prosper and execute judgment and righteousness in the earth in his days judah will be saved and israel will dwell safely now this is his name the branch from david who's a king who's the child born the mighty god to sit on david's throne of isaiah 9 what is his name this is his name by which he will be called Yahweh, our righteousness. His name is Yahweh, Jehovah, our righteousness. So he's not, he's not only the mighty God, he's Yahweh, our righteousness. And the third prophecy, because I'm going to show you now 
where the New Testament quotes this. The New Testament quotes this. After Jesus was born, in the very place this prophet said Messiah would be born. Micah chapter 5, verse 2. Micah chapter 5, verse 2. But you, Bethlehem, Ephrathah. Ephrathah, or Ephrathah. Some pronounce it differently. But everyone pay attention, and my Muslim friend pay attention. From where? Bethlehem. Though you are little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of you shall come forth to me the one to be ruler in Israel. Again, connected with Jeremiah 23, the righteous branch from David, who's a king, the child born who sits on David's throne, same individual in all three prophecies, the ruler of Israel. The one to be ruler in Israel, now pay attention, how old is he? Whose goings forth are from of old, from eternity, from the days of eternity. So this human ruler, this child born, who's a branch of David, a descendant of David, to sit on David's throne as a king, he actually comes from eternity. He's eternal from the days of eternity. And where will he come from? He comes from eternity to Bethlehem. Now let's see where Jesus was born. Let's see if Jesus fulfills the prophecy. Because you asked for it, you get it. Matthew 2, verses 1 to 6. Matthew 2, verses 1 to 6. Now after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea. Oh wow. So Jesus is born exactly where the prophet Micah said the ruler would be born. Now after Jesus is born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, Behold, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? That's Micah 5, 2. The one to be ruler over Israel. For we have seen a star in the east and have come to worship him. When Herod the king heard this, he was troubled and all Jerusalem with him. And when he had gathered all the chief priests and scribes of the people together, he inquired of them where the Christ, el Messiah, was to be born. So he's asking the Jewish scholars, the ulama of Bani Israel, the scholars of Israel, where will the Messiah be born? El Messiah. What did they say? So they said to him, in Bethlehem of Judea, for thus it is written by the prophet. But you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judea, are not the least among the rulers of Judah, for out of you shall come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. Now, David, help me understand. Even at the time of Jesus, the Jewish scholars of the Old Testament, when asked, where will the Messiah be born? They quoted Micah 5, verse 2, the prophecy that says, this ruler comes from Bethlehem, but he's actually eternal because he comes from the days of eternity. Doesn't this prove then that Jesus the Messiah is the God-man? If he's eternal and he'll be born, does that make him the God-man? Sounds like it. Okay, so I answered his question. All right, so hope that helps, Kay Azim. And uh, yeah, we were taking a question from the comments there, but basically I thought that was a good question to kind of lead into this, uh, alhamdulillah, namely that, you know, on questions of the deity of Christ and the doctrine of the Trinity, we're not just dealing with some Christian doctrine that arose later on in Christian history. We're not dealing with something that Christian theologians came up with. These things were prophesied in the Old Testament, and we see them revealed in revealed more fully in the New Testament. All right, so uh, Alhamdulillah, if you wanted to recap what you what your what your concern about the Trinity was, and then Sam can go ahead and respond. Yeah, uh, David just wanted to confirm uh, when I started my case, I also gave um, a few reasons. Um, you said uh, uh, that you uh, I had to make a case for Muhammad. So can I just recap that as well so that he can respond we're, we're, to that? We're, well? we're, we're going to go through all this. I took notes. So uh, I, I, I started off, uh, put you down for uh, comments about the doctrine of the Trinity, and then that Jesus uh, couldn't have died. Could, Jesus' death couldn't have been a great sacrifice because only his body would have died. And then I have you mentioning the character of Muhammad, that he didn't do some of the things that a lot of other people were doing at his time. You mentioned Muhammad performing miracles I, i'll just speak up i'll just speak up i'll just speak up what's that what happened yeah, no I, i'm just saying that i'll just speak up if you if you let me i'll just um ask one or two questions and i'll just speak sure. up yeah okay um, yeah so um uh, i'll come to the trinity uh, afterwards so when i started uh, to um, uh, build my case for muhammad uh, first of all, I discussed his uh, good biography. I told you that they had, he had qualities. 
um, of a um, person which was not possible in, in those times because there was um, a lot of um, ignorance and evil in the society. Um, moreover, um, I discussed a few miracles of him. I said that um, uh, although um, I said that God gave him miracles and uh, he, they weren't just miracles that um, only he saw and he reported people that, uh, to people that God has given me miracles, but people saw them and they had written them down in traditions. Moreover, uh, I said that um, in the kingdom of God, um, a liar and a false prophet never succeeds. We don't have any prophet in this world who was a false prophet, um, like um, according to me, uh, that had succeeded because God always humiliates such people. Um, moreover, I said that um, if you, um, there are two possible, uh, three possibilities of the Quran. Uh, number one, that um, it is written by Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam himself, but that is not possible because he was, we call him Ummi, that means illiterate, he had not studied, he could not write, he could not read. The second possibility is that a one of the most righteous men sat down and wrote the Quran, which was also not possible because I told you that there might have been one or two people who could have just snitched on him, but there were more than 50 or 60 scribes and even more people than that that had seen him getting the revelation. And number three, that it can be divine revelation, um, which um, could have been proven. For example, um, um, I've read about the prophecies about the Romans defeating the Persians and then afterwards them defeating uh, and there are other uh, prophecies as well. I, I'm, I, I'm sure that you guys must have heard of it and uh, Sam has such a, a good memory. He must have, uh, he, he must know them more than me. Um, moreover, um, uh, um, moreover, um, yeah, uh, and also um, Prophet Muhammad, uh, uh, like we uh, discussed um, uh, even before this, that um, can you guys hear me? Yes, yes, go ahead. Yeah, yeah. Um, and uh, after Prophet uh, Muhammad Sallallahu um, had uh, a, such an increase in knowledge, which was um, impossible to tell, because if you look at uh, people like Mirza Ghulam Ahmed Kaidiani, they wrote um, hundreds of uh, books, but they were not able to gain such knowledge because he was a false prophet. We consider him to be a false prophet. Um, that was moreover. That was my case. Um, if um, he can refute my five yeah, points, yeah, we can. We can. All right. I would like to yeah. talk about the prophecy if you want. Let me know, and then we can talk miracles. But first, the prophecy. Okay. Yeah. No. 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 Uh, so I, I I wrote down all of his points here. We don't need to go in any particular order. Of Sam, if you want to talk about the prophecy first, yes, then go the with the prophecy. Okay, well, I'll, I'll, I'll read the verses of the Quran if you want to write them for the sake of time, because I don't want you to have to find them. It'll take too much time. But can when I give you a verse, you can write it down. And if you want to go back and check it, you can. But uh, let me, I'm going to give you some verses if you're ready. Alhamdulillah. Are you ready? Can you hear me? Yeah, he's nodding. Oh, okay. I'm sorry, because remember, I have to go to the Quran browser, so I'm not seeing the screen. Okay. Chapter 6, verse 114, write this down, I'll read it for you, I'm using Yusuf Ali. I don't care what translation you want to use, you can use, but for the sake of convenience, I'm using Yusuf Ali. Chapter 6, verse 114, say, shall I seek for judge other than God, Arabic, it's Allah. When he it is who has sent unto you the book, explained in detail. So alhamdulillah, I just want you to focus on the words explained in detail. I'm going to come back to that in a minute. This book, Quran, explained in detail. They knew, they know full well to whom we have given the book, that it hath been sent down from thy Lord in truth. Never be then of those who doubt. So that was chapter 6, verse 114. The second verse I want you to write down. Chapter 12, verse 111. Chapter 12, verse 111. Right? So I'm going to read it. Chapter 12, verse 111. There is in their stories instruction, instruction for men endowed with understanding. It is not a tale invented, but a confirmation of what came before it. Now, here's the part I want you to focus on. A detailed explanation, exposition of all things. This Quran is a detailed exposition of all things. Explains everything in detail. That's how Hilali Khan translates it. 
and a guide and a mercy to any such as believe. So that was the second verse. Two more. Chapter 16, verse 89. Chapter 16, verse 89. So I'm going to read it. 1689. One day we shall raise from all peoples a witness against them, from amongst themselves, and we shall bring thee as a witness against these thy people. And we have, we have sent down to thee, meaning Muhammad, the book explaining all things. Explaining all things. I want to repeat it so everyone else understands what the Quran is saying. The Quran explains everything in detail, all things, not some things. A guide, a mercy, and a glad tidings to Muslims. Final one, final one. Chapter 41, verse 3. Chapter 41, verse 3. A book whereof the verses are explained in detail. So this book explains the verses in detail. I'm going to repeat it again because I don't want people to miss this. This book, the verses explained in detail. A Quran in Arabic for people to understand. Now, if the Quran is right and it's not full of contradictions and it's not wrong, if the Quran explains everything in detail, all things in detail, explains its verses in detail, that means when I go to your prophecy, because you're referring to chapter 30 of the Quran, chapter 30, verses 1 to 4. Chapter 30, verses 1 to 4, the Quran should explain to me what I'm about to read. So let's read. Chapter 30, verses 1 to 4. Alif, Lam, Mim. A-L-M. Alif, Lam, Mim. The Roman Empire has been defeated in a land close by, but they, after this defeat of theirs, will soon be victorious within a few years. With God is the decision in the past and in the future, and that day shall the believers rejoice. So, alhamdulillah, it says the Romans have been defeated in a land close by, and then after their defeat, within a few years, they shall be victorious. So, the Quran says it explains everything in detail, alhamdulillah, everything. That means it's going to explain this. Here's my question, and I need you to answer from the Quran, because... Alhamdulillah, once you go outside the Quran, you go to Hadith, you just prove the Quran is wrong, it's not a miracle. Who defeated the Romans? Where were they defeated? What land? And a few years is how many years exactly? A few years, what, two years, three years, four years? And a few years from what date? So let me repeat the questions. Who defeated them? You said the Persians. Show me that in the chapter. Who defeated them? Land where? Land close by where? What land? Close by Turkey? Close by Russia? What land? How do you know? All right. And then it says they'll be a victorious in a few years. A few years of what? Two years? Three years? Four years? Five years? If Allah's all knowing, can't He give me the exact year? And a few years from what date? What's the date? Quran says explains everything in detail. Please show me from the Quran the answer, because if you can't, then you prove the Quran is wrong. Um, okay, uh, David, uh, I want to know which um, uh, translation you're using. Anyone you want to use, because the Arabic no. is clear. I was yeah, using Yusuf okay. Ali. Okay, so um, wait, I'll just go back. Um, I was using a translation on Quran.com. Mm -hmm. If you go over there, um, and if you look at the um, fourth verse, you can say that in the translation it is written within three to nine years. That's not um, the Arabic. The Arabic doesn't um, say that. Yeah, that's that's them adding yeah. that's them adding their their commentary. Yeah. So you you Muslims, I just read chapter forty one verse three. Yeah. It says the Quran is Arabic, not English commentary. That's the right. English translation. The Arabic doesn't yeah. say three to nine. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, okay. So um, there are three explanations and uh, to which I, uh, I can give you. Uh, number one, you said that it says that it uh, uh, explains everything. So basically, if you look inside the tafsir, because there is an interpretation of Quran, I'm not going to deny that every uh, sect has an interpretation of Quran. So what we think is that uh, basically Quran is a complete code of um, life. And therefore, um, it says that it, it it explains everything that is needed for a human being um, to um, live his life successfully in the, uh, or submit um, his will to God. So what we're talking about over here is that the Quran successfully talks about the five pillars 
Quran successfully talks about the um, six um, um, uh, about these um, uh, six articles of faith. Now uh, understand that. Um, I'm now, before you I'm going to talk about. Yeah, I'm wait, gonna... wait one second, one second, yeah, one yeah. second. Just wait one second. Yeah. Uh, I'm very sorry. Uh, so basically, um, Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam, uh, our beloved prophet, he said that uh, God had sent him with um, two knowledge. So basically, what happened was that um, the things that were written in the Quran were further explained by our um, uh, prophet. So, um, for example, uh, and also the uh, Quran was uh, revealed at certain points. So, for example, if it was Battle of Badr, so verses were revealed over there. So, not in every verse it uh, would have been written that um, uh, it was the Battle of Badr. So, therefore, at that time, everyone knew that who had been defeated. Uh, and they knew that it was the um, Byzantines that have been defeated and the Muslims were very grieved over that. But when this verse came and afterwards the Persians were defeated, um, the Muslims rejoiced and said that it was a prophecy. Because um, it, even t telling us about this, that the Byzantines, which was a huge empire, will get defeated. Um, uh, Alhamdulillah, you're... Can, can I interject before you say, wait, you yeah. went off topic because all these well, details yeah. you gave me are not in the Quran. Yes. Sam, so before Sam, you move on, Sam, I just want to I just want to point out because he's uh, uh, he, he's yeah. he's he's basically saying that the Quran. So j just just to clarify, yeah, I got his Alhamdulillah. Point. Yeah. Yeah. I, know what he's uh, yeah, just, I, 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 I know you do. I'm trying to make sure everyone else everyone else does, because we got comments like uh, Mahi Jam saying Sam is asking a nonsense question yeah, and stuff I like that. that. So, too, so yeah. they so they they're, they're not understanding the point. So, ladies and gentlemen, uh, just to just to recap here. Uh, Abdullah is saying that one of the evidences, one of the uh, proofs that Muhammad is a prophet is that he gave a prophecy about the future. So he predicted, he predicted the outcome of a battle. So we're supposed to take this as evidence. Obviously, if we're going to take this as evidence, then we have to examine it and see whether it is really uh, actually good evidence. Sam went to the Quran and pointed out that the Quran says repeatedly that it's all explained in detail. And yet, if you go to the actual verse, it's completely unclear. It doesn't say who's going to defeat them. It, 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 it says few years, but not few years from when. And so Sam is pointing out that if you just go with the Quran, you wouldn't know what in the world this is talking about. And therefore, you wouldn't know if it's going to be fulfilled. You have to go outside of the Quran. But that's Sam's point, that you the Quran claims to be explained in detail, and yet you'd have to go outside of the Quran. And Hamdullah's response is that, uh, you know, given the the environment of the time, there are people who would know what this is talking about, and therefore they would they would know all the details. They know when it was revealed, so they know when it's gonna you know when it's fulfilled, who it's talking about, and they know the details. So just wanted everyone to understand that's kind of where we're at now. Now, now Sam, what are your thoughts? Yeah. Now, you again proved the Quran is false because you said it was the battle batter. How do you know? Where did the ayah say, where did the Quran say, where did the surah say, this was revealed during the time of Badr. Show me that from the Quran. Then you also said, alhamdulillah, that the Quran is talking about that it gives you a detailed explanation for your life. None of the verses said what you said. The verses said that this Quran is a book that explains everything in detail. It didn't just limit it to what you wanted it to be limited to. But you said now, I want everyone to hear it. That's why I didn't want you to just keep repeating the same point because you just proved the Quran is wrong. You said this was at the time of Badr and the Byzantines. How do you know the date this is at the time of Badr? Where did this surah say that? Where did the surah say this surah came down during the time of Badr and that the Muslims rejoice that the Persians were conquered because the pagans... They wanted the Persians to win, whereas the Muslims wanted the Romans to win because they were people of the book. Where did you get that? How do you know it's at the time of battle? In fact, let me ask you another question. How do you know this Quran was even written or recited in the 7th century, in the 600s? Because you're all of this you're getting from Hadith 100, 200 years later. So I'm going to ask my challenge again. Alham alhamdulillah. The Quran says this explains everything in detail. Show me in chapter 30, it says this is at the time of batter, and this is now <clears throat> talking about the defeat of the Byzantines. Show me that. Don't assume it. I'm sorry, not Byzantine. The Byzantine is 
the Romans. The, the defeat yeah. of the Persians. Show me it's referring to the Persians being defeated by the Romans later because the Persians had defeated them at the time of battle. Show that. I need okay. the verse. Give me the ayah. Okay, okay. okay. Um, uh, Sam, I just want to ask you a question. Just reply with a simple yes or no. Do you if know that when certain verses um, of the Bible were written down um, I by don't need the to. Different Okay. I'll tell you why. Can so, I answer now? Well done. Before you go, no, no, well no. I need to okay. answer the question. Wait, That's wait, not wait. yes or no. I'm to be patient. Let me answer your question. The yeah, Bible sure nowhere yeah. claims, you're talking over me now. The Bible nowhere claims that this is a book that explains everything in detail. When you can quote that verse in the Bible, then your argument is good. But right now, it's a bad argument. We call it in logic, too quokey. You too. Does the Quran say it explains everything in detail? Yes, not the Bible. So that's not going to work. So now please answer my question, Abdullah. Okay. Uh, so um, even though it was my time and you were telling me that I was talking over you. Uh, no, just, I just tell you. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> okay. So um, what I'm going to tell you is that uh, we Muslims and all these scribes of the divine revelation had created a uh, timeline. So, for example, if you open the modern day Quran and if you... Um, like in most Qurans, there would be written the background of the entire surah. Um, and moreover, even if that isn't uh, written, you know that in which year it was uh, brought upon. For example, certain surahs were revealed in um, 6 after Hijri and certain surahs were revealed. Basically, it's an entire timeline in which you know that when certain surahs were revealed. So, um, for example, if I say that on 16 June, Pakistan suffered a loss. I'm just talking about a cricket match. So we wouldn't say that, oh, on which 16 June? We all know that Pakistan, I mean, I mean you might not be watching cricket, but a, fan, but a uh, cricket fan would obviously know that Pakistan had lost on 16 June, even besides the year to India. So uh, if such a big war happening, everyone would know, obviously, that when this was happening, and the uh, timeline was written and moreover you say that it was it says that it, it covers everything in detail i think that um i have to um uh, uh, say it again and again that the uh, only explanation you're going to get from me is that um the quran explains the uh, code of life um, every uh, the code of life perfectly in every detail which i told you that includes the five pillars and the six uh, articles of faith but moreover if you're saying that it uh, would uh, explain everything in detail i can also say that the holy prophet used to get the explanation from the angels and then he used to further give us the tafsir because if you say this about any book then the then people would say okay why isn't this explained you've seen many um, ignorant atheists who when they debate they tell you okay then explain this and they explain that and explain that no i mean obviously it's coming from um, God, I don't think so that um, there are certain things from the unseen that uh, that is not understandable by every human being. You told me that what Alif Lam Mim says, um, yeah. we Muslims um, have it that it does have a meaning, but there are two different aspects to it. Number one is that only um, God, uh, God knows about it and these are code words which will be revealed on the day of judgment and number two is that some Sufis and uh, uh, some Sufis uh, in the uh, um, or throughout the world considered that um, there are four understandings of the Quran one understanding is that um, the all the um, normal people get it and then secondly saints and the prophets and then God only so it is explained um, uh, the Quran has explained everything in its textual form, but I think the interpretation and understanding varies from every person to every person. Some people uh, take the um, uh, literal meaning. There are uh, the Shias and the Sufis who believe that there is a hidden uh, or a hidden message in the Quran. So I think, um, uh, and also um, just before we move on, um, I'd like, um, like, I mean, obviously, I want you to refute my points. So, if you could just refute the other four points which I had, if yeah, they will. Yeah, sure. yeah, okay. Okay, now, but you, you said a lot of stuff again, but you're not answering my question. Now, I'm going to even now use your own argument. None of the verses that I quoted said what you said. You keep interpreting the verses the way you want, but you're not addressing what the verses actually say. Even the example of the date you gave. 
uh, about the cricket match. But that again shows you're assuming that this chapter of the Quran was written at this time in history. Where did you get that from? You didn't get it from the Quran. The Quran didn't tell you when it was written. And you keep assuming, see, this is at the time of Muhammad in in Mecca when there was the Meccans who were hoping that the Persians would defeat. the. All of that that you got is not from the Quran. And that's the challenge. How do you know this was composed at the time of Muhammad or at the time of the Persian defeating the Romans? You don't. That's not from the Quran, but the Quran says it is a book that explains everything in detail. But the fact that you keep going outside the book, you just prove the Quran is wrong. So thank you for that. But you kept saying the five pillars of Islam. Now here I'm going to use that argument to show you that even what you said, the Quran fails. I want you to quote the ayah. So please listen to my question because this doesn't take long to answer. Quote the ayah that tells you the shahada that you must say, I bear witness there is no God but Allah, and I bear witness that Muhammad is the messenger of Allah. Show me that pillar, that article of faith in the Quran. Show me that. Where's the ayah that says that this is what you must say to become Muslim? Okay. Um, I think we'll have to have a uh, understanding of what a shahada is. Um, a shahada means that it is a... Uh, wait, can you hear me? Hamdu, can you give me the verse instead of explaining yeah, to me what the wait, shahada wait. is? Because the shahada is, there is no God but Allah, and I bear witness Muhammad is yeah, his messenger. Okay. Can you show me that so, in the Quran? Yeah, wait. Uh, so, what I'm trying to say is that, uh, let me just firstly explain. The shahada means a testimony. So, without that, you're out of the uh, faith system, uh, or you're out of the uh, understanding of what a Muslim is. Now, what does the shahada say? It says that, I bear witness that there is no God. And I believe that Prophet Muhammad is a slave and a messenger of Allah. Now understand that the Quran in, uh, in various places discusses the Tawheed. And in uh, various, uh, various places discusses that Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam uh, sorry, uh, is the seal of the prophets, is the last prophet and is a slave of Allah. Now understand that what is the difference between a Christian and a Muslim? What is the difference between a Jew and a Muslim? The yeah. difference is that we believe in Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. May peace be upon him, and you don't. So the thing is that to Alhamdulillah, we, you know, I'm, yeah, I'm going to sound wait, rude wait, because I wait. keep cutting up because you're going on tangents. For the sake no. of time, our time is running out. Yeah, Give wait. me the verse in the Quran that says, no. "To be a Muslim, you must say, I bear witness there is no God but Allah, and I bear witness that Muhammad is a slave yeah. and messenger." Can yeah. you just give me the verse? I, the explanation okay. you can give it to someone that you want no. to convince, but can you show me, because alhamdulillah, listen as much as you speak, because it's going to help you how to answer the question. Listen as much as you speak. You said that the Quran provides a full detailed explanation of the pillars, the pillars, you said that, the pillars, and also the articles of faith, Iman and Islam. I, I know what you're saying. One of your belief, core beliefs is that you must say the Kalima, that's one of the pillars. There is no God but Allah, and Muhammad is his messenger and his slave. Please, you said the Quran provides the full details for the pillars and articles of faith. Very simple. I didn't even ask you about prayers. If I ask you about prayers, we're going to be here until midnight. No. Wait, can you give I, me the ayah? Alhamdulillah. Can you give me the ayah? Quote the ayah that says, here is what Islam is and Iman. You must bear witness, there is no God but Allah, and then bear witness that Muhammad is a slave and messenger. Is there an ayah that says that? Um, uh, okay. Um, uh, Sam, uh, basically, uh, I'll, I'll give you an ayah, don't worry. Um, okay. Yeah. But before that, I'm just going to uh, tell you that what I meant to say and what I'm going to say again and again was, uh, I think you're lagging a bit over there, uh, your internet. Um, yes. Um, is that... Um, is that the Quran gives you an explanation for the code of life. I'm not saying that every uh, thing is um, written in detail about how you pray and because we understand that God had given this uh, when uh, Prophet uh, Muhammad went. Oh, but I'll just give you the verse. Um, there are a couple of verses. Number one is that um, 
obey allah and obey his uh, messenger and then god testifies oh you believe obey allah and obey the messenger and those charged with authority amongst you this is quran chapter 4 verse 69 so understand that when god is testifying himself and is giving the shahada himself that prophet muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam is his messenger then humans also need to uh, do that what is the one way that you can obey a messenger is the if you testify that he is really a messenger so obey allah and obey his messenger okay if you can say that up no because okay. um you said you just quoted the verse now you just proved the shahada you say it all wrong because the shahada now is oh, i bear witness there is no god but allah and muhammad is a slave and messenger and i bear witness that i have to obey those in authority because you just quoted that i right so why isn't your shahada let me go with what you said pay attention you said there's a verse that says obey allah and the messenger and those who are in authority so now you prove the real shahada is i bear witness there is no god but allah i bear witness that muhammad is the messenger and i bear witness that i have to obey those in authority so is that your shahada no that isn't but um what, why did you quote that verse no but that's because that's because i like i told you before that the difference between you and i is that i believe in prophet muhammad as a messenger so if you go to other verses for example 331 um if you should love allah then follow uh, muhammad um if if uh, so um in god's messenger you have indeed a good example for everyone who looks forward uh, to hope to uh, uh, with hope to god and the last day now um understand that what i'm trying to tell you again and again is that um these verses are directed towards muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam so obviously if god which verses given, are if, directed which verses are directed to muhammad um chapter 3 verse number 31 to 32 uh and the um previous one which i told you oh you believe obey allah and obey the messenger now understand if now before you move on all that let me no. deal with it because the name muhammad only appears four times in the quran so when it says obey the messenger <clears throat> how do you know that's muhammad and not somebody else yeah but you you'll have to tell me even if it mentions four times the quran it it, it does mention it uh, um, muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam may peace be upon him in the status of a messenger right as in the status of a seal of the prophets yeah that's not my not question that? yeah yeah okay. listen my question is no, when no. it says follow the of allah and the messenger who's the messenger that you're supposed to follow you say muhammad how do you know the verse didn't say muhammad because because the quran was revealed um on prophet muhammad because the quran also tells us to follow the previous scripts but it says that but it says that they have been corrupted that's what we believe right so the person who was at that time and who was sent for the judgment of prophet who was sent for the judgment at that time was prophet muhammad so that's what that's how do you know though you see again we're going in circles we, and i'm we, you we keep saying that. was revealed to muhammad where yeah. does the quran say This the Quran, the 114 chapters of the Quran was sent down yeah. to a man named Muhammad who's the messenger of Allah. The name Muhammad only appears four times. Maybe you can argue yeah. in those four places it's Muhammad, but you keep saying yeah, but you're not listening to my argument. Listen a little bit more. Listen to my challenge. Show me where it says obey Allah and the messenger. That messenger is Muhammad because you haven't proven to me those verses were sent down to Muhammad in that time you keep assuming this because you're getting this from information outside the Quran now prove to me in chapter 4 verse 80 which you cited and chapter 3 verses 31 32 which you were citing that is muhammad commanded to speak and not some messenger that you don't know of what's your proof my i have two proofs number one is that like you said uh, so, uh, sorry um i have two proofs number one is that i told you that in the quran quran only tells us to obey um a certain messenger whose script has not been corrupted and obviously it is the now what who uh, to whom was the quran revealed to prophet muhammad so we know that if the quran tells us that if we have to follow a certain messenger that is uh, truly right then it would be the current pro prophet which is prophet muhammad and number 2 is that whenever the revelations uh were revealed the prophet muhammad used to um uh, tell uh, and uh, used to um tell the um scribes the tafsir of the revelations so when the when this uh, that was obviously given to him by uh, allah almighty 
so when this verse was revealed um uh, prophet muhammad uh, not only did prophet muhammad but god uh, 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 but prophet muhammad himself told everyone that it uh, the verses were for him now if you are uh, now understand that if you really say that the uh, quran was revealed to muhammad and it, it didn't mention muhammad this is not uh, possible because then how is how is this possible that it was revealed to muhammad and it didn't um Uh, it didn't in divine revelation was revealed to someone and then it was uh, not mentioning his name or to obey him yeah i mean are you asking me a question or is that a question for me you can take it as a question for you no, but yeah, no because um, i think yeah we're the same we're going in the same points so we can go to the other points i don't want to keep just on the same point so what was the other points you want to discuss uh, i i i would like to i would like to ask a, a quick question here um yes. uh, along the issue because this this kind of was set off by um by the prophecy um yes. and muslims having to go outside of the quran in order to know what this is even talking about and yep. when the prophecy was made and uh, how it was fulfilled and things like that when so as, as sam sam's point has been the quran claims to uh to explain itself in detail and yet we're, we're looking at this fulfilled prophecy and we're asking hey how clear is this prophecy because notice if you're just saying hey this group won but later this group will won this group will win later i mean you know my goodness uh if you, if you have if you have a war and wars go back and forth and one 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 group wins one and one group wins you know the next battle and so on i mean i could very easily make myself a, a prophet right now i say you know last year the pittsburgh steelers lost but at some point in the future a few years from now maybe a lot of years from now at some point they'll win you know that that's not going to be very strong evidence these things these things happen like this but here's the point when we when we go outside the quran when we go outside the Quran and then we have to start going to other Muslim sources to see what these passages are talking about and so on, we find things like, let's see this, if I can get up on the screen here. So notice what we have here. So this is from Jamiat Termidi, 2935. And it says, Abu Sa'id narrated, on the day of the Battle of Badr, the Romans had a victory over the Persians. So on the day of the Battle of Badr, the Romans had a victory over the Persians. So the believers were pleased with that. Then the following was revealed. Aleph Lam Min. The Romans have been defeated. And so let me go ahead and read the passage of the Quran that is supposedly confirmed here. Mm -hmm. uh, so Aleph, so uh, Surah 30. Uh, Aleph Lam Mim. The Romans are vanquished in a near land, and they, after being vanquished, shall overcome within a few years. Allah's is the command before and after. And on that day, the believers shall rejoice. So the Romans are vanquished in a near land, and they, after being vanquished, who by, we don't know, shall overcome. So after being vanquished at this point, they will come back and, and they will win after a few years. Now, again, this prophecy here. So on the so Battle of Badr, it says right here, Abu Sa'id narrated, on the day of the Battle of Badr, the Romans had a victory over the Persians. So the believers were pleased with that. Then the following was revealed. So according to this, according to this, these verses, supposedly giving a miraculous prophecy of the future, were revealed after the Muslims already heard that the Romans had a victory over the Persians. Yep. So anyway, here's my point. Now, a Muslim can say this this hadith is wrong. This, uh, yeah, uh, no, Jamia Termini 2935 is wrong because this says that Muslims got this revelation, that, th that Muhammad received this revelation about the Romans uh, coming back and, and scoring a victory after the Muslims already heard about it, right? So, so anyway, the point here is if you're yeah. going outside the Quran, then you have to go to other sources. But we go to the sources like this and there's no prophecy, there's no prophecy at, at all that's been fulfilled. The, the the prophecy in the Quran was revealed after they already heard about it. So you'll have to say, no, this is unreliable and we'll have to go with other hadiths. And you could avoid this problem if the Quran simply did what it said, namely explains all things. And so anyway, the, 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 the entire point of that was the Quran, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. The, yeah the Quran. And before, yeah, 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 one second. The Quran. Finish your point. Let them finish the yeah, point. Go ahead, yeah, the please. Quran claims to be explained, but it doesn't, and therefore we have to go outside it. But when we go outside it, we find 
you know, completely conflicting and contradictory hadiths. Which ones do we want to go? Th which ones do we want to go to? The Muslim method seems to be: let me go to this passage in the Quran, give it the interpretation I want, say that it was revealed at a particular time when I want, and I'll go outside of the Quran, but I'll go to sources that confirm this. And even though Muhammad's, I mean, his basic claim is: hey, the Romans were defeated, but you know they're going to get a victory later on, which anyone in history could have predicted. Anyone in history could have predicted that. <clears throat> And we ha and then we have to pick and choose the hadith that we go to because if we go to Jamia Termidi twenty nine thirty five, this says that the verses were that this these verses were revealed after they already heard about the Roman victory, and so the the point here is I understand that as a Muslim, you want to believe that Muhammad's a prophet and he predicted the future, but I have to say this is the most common prophecy we hear about from Muslims. When we say, hey, what, what, what did your prophet prophesy? This is the number one, their go-to passage. And you go to the passage and it's not clear at all what it's saying. And you have to go completely outside of the Quran. And when you go outside of the Quran, then you have to start picking and choosing which sources you're going with. And at the end of the day, it's just saying, hey, the Romans lost, but later they'll win. And so it's like, if this is the, the best evidence that Muhammad predicted the future and could prophesy, um, do you see why this wouldn't be very yeah. impressive to to us? And That's my question. Dave, before, yeah, alhamdulillah, before you say, I just want this so the non-Muslims can see. This is assuming, because remember, when the Quran was written, the Arabic text, the vowel markings were added later. I don't know if many, even Muslims, are aware of this. Go online. You can download this for free, and I recommend you get this translation. It's called Quran, a reformist translation. It's free. They made it available for free as a PDF. I have the hard copy and I got the PDF. Quran, a reformist translation. Now remember when the Quran was originally written, it was a consonantal text. Are you aware that the consonantal text of this section can be read differently? Here it is, Quran, reformist translation, page 348. Guys, please pay attention to how this Quran translates it. Chapter, uh, I'm sorry, page 348. Quran, reformist translation. Guys, pay attention to the world of difference. The Romans have won, not were defeated. The Romans have won at the lowest point on the earth, but after their victory, they will be defeated. In a few years, the decision before and after is for God, and on that day, those acknowledged will rejoice. Notice this translation say, the Romans were defeated, and the land closed by, and in a few years, they'll be victorious. Let me repeat it again. This particular translation, the Romans have won at the lowest point on the earth, but after their victory, they will be defeated. Now, there's a note. These are Muslims. They don't follow the Hadith. Guys, let me read the note. This is supposedly this impressive prophecy, and they can't even agree what exactly is saying. Now, watch here. Let me read what it says here. You might have noticed that we translated the reference of the verb galiba, um, galiba or galaba, differently than the, this is by the way page 351 page 351 you can download it for free you might have noticed that we translated the reference of the verb galaba differently than the traditional translations instead of reading the verb in chapter 30 verse 2 as gulibat were defeated we read as galabat which means just the opposite of defeated similar we also read its continuous future tense in the following verse differently the prophecy of the verse was realized in 636 four years after the death of muhammad when muslims confronted the army of byzantine empire around yarmouk river in one of the most significant battles in history under the command of khalid or khalid ibn walid the muslim army beat the christian imperial army of four or more times their numbers the Six-Day War, Yarmouk, occurred in an area near the Sea of Galilee and the Dead Sea, which are located in lowest land depression on Earth, 200-400 meters below sea level. They can't even agree what is this referring to. Did you guys see that? The traditional translation is, Romans were defeated, and a few years they'll be victorious. And who defeated them? The Persians. And they'll defeat the Persians. These Muslims say, no, 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 no. It's not about the Romans were victorious and will be defeated, and they were defeated by the Muslims. Guys, can you make up your mind? What is this talking about? Is this a prophecy of the Persians defeating the Romans and the Romans conquering the Persians? Or is it a prophecy the Romans are victorious and will be defeated by the Muslims? How can you tell? Because the Quran fails to provide detailed 
<clears throat> explanation for its passages. So I just want to let you know, this is a debate among Muslims, not Muslims and Christians. All right, now uh, let, let's go ahead and give Hamdullah uh, plenty of time to respond to, to anything we've said so far. Go ahead, sir. Uh, yeah, uh, David, I'd just like to ask you for a favor. Um, can you just tell me uh, when uh, when I get my last turn, okay? Like when you're like, we're about to wrap up and you can like give the... Yeah, well, what, what, once once we're getting to the end, we will make sure, well, I, I will I will probably give you the last word. Apart from me saying, apart from me saying bye to everyone, we, we, we normally oh. we normally try to give uh, give guests the last word. So go ahead. And when would when would be that? Uh, probably about another half hour or so. Okay. Um, um, okay, Sam. Um, just before you respond again. Oh, oh yeah. Oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. Ahead, yeah, I just like to tell you this: that um, as you know, that there are many sects in Islam, right? Uh, why is that? That's not because we follow different Qurans. We follow different interpretations of the Quran. Now, understand that even. Just for the sake of your argument, if we take that um, verse as well, that the Muslims defeated the Romans or the uh, um, Byzantines uh, were uh, were defeated, I think both of them uh, became uh, true. And uh, moreover, uh, I'd just like to repeat one thing. I just uh, found out a verse. It says that um, it's Quran chapter 29 verse um, 49 it says that indeed it is the quran that is present as ma uh, manifest signs in the breast of those who have been given the knowledge i think the it explains um that the quran obviously uh, explained in every detail uh, like the our prophet also said that i've been given two knowledges so it was given to the prophet muhammad so like i i explained that that when the uh, verses were revealed prophet muhammad used to explain them now when i say that uh, i just like to refer to you when you said that uh, quran says that everything is covered in detail uh, when it was revealed in detail so it is talking about um, uh, prophet muhammad that he got everything in detail and therefore he explained it for example zakat he tells you how much um, uh, what is the percentage of zakat for example he discusses and the muslim fiqh is um, uh, uh, fiqh means the legal uh, constitution or the Sharia is based upon four things: uh, the Quran, the Hadith, the um, uh, the Ijma, uh, which is the legal consensus, um, and the because the, uh, because God knew that there would be modern times and there would be other times um, when there would be n new issues that would arise, and therefore He gave us a wider uh, range of um, things to decide from. Moreover, I think we have half an hour. I think, um, you know, obviously, you, uh, Sam, you might have this in your mind. But like I said before, that um, in the start of my case, I asked um, two, uh, for, for six things or five things. Yeah. You um, engaged with two of them. I'd really be uh, appreciating. Yeah, if that's what I want to go to the next yeah. one. Yeah. yeah. Um, yeah. You don't want to um, deal with the issue of Muhammad uh, because you're saying about his his character and so forth. So um, I want to do that one. If yes, um, Sam, no, no, it... wait, wait, wait. Wait, 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 oh, wait, wait. Yeah, uh, I'm sorry. I was just saying that, um, uh, like, two main points which I want you to explain because obviously everyone says that their prophet, are, and we also say that our prophet had the uh, best character, but there are two points that I wanted you to explain from a neutral point of view. Number one is that uh, the miracles uh, God gave him, for example, and he didn't only report them, his companions reported them. And number two, I said that even if um, uh, the possibilities of who wrote the Quran, I told you. Mm -hmm. So if you could just tell me that even if it was written yeah, by a certain group or a certain person, yeah. then why didn't a certain, uh, why out of all the people, a certain person didn't snitch or something? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so well, they did people. snitch. Yeah. They did yeah. snitch. No, actually, they did snitch. Your own hadith. Uh, here, I'll well, give you a name. I'm answering yeah. you if you want to talk I, over me. Yeah. Abdullah ibn Saar, Abi Saar. Abdullah ibn Abi Saar. Do you know him? Uh, yes, I do know him, and okay, I'll explain so in that. chapter six. Well, before you explain, you need to listen just as much as you speak, because the more you speak, the less you listen. In chapter okay. six, verse ninety-three, the Quran it says, Abdullah ibn Abi Sar used to change the ayat for your prophet, and he left Islam, and he was one of the ten that Muhammad said killed, but he was the foster brother of Uthman ibn Affan, and Uthman tried to bring him to your prophet, 
and ask him for pardon. He didn't say anything, and he finally let him go. So, and there's others. There's even a hadith in Bukhari where Christian said, I write the revelations for your prophet. But before we go there, before I go to the miracles, I'm going to show you your Quran shows your prophet did no miracles. But we're going to talk about his character first. Before we go, we're going to talk about the character, and I'm going to answer your points. Because you kept on about his character, his character, and you want to keep going to the hadith. Well, that's good, because now the hadith is going to prove very damaging for the character of your prophet. Chapter 4 of the Quran, Surah An-Nisa, chapter 4, verse 24. Are you ready for me to read it? Are you ready for that? I can read it? Just go ahead, sir. Yeah, you can. Okay. Okay, chapter 4, verse 24. Here it is, because you said his character. What well, I'm going to show you from the Quran and the Hadith that you keep appealing to, his character was very terrible. In chapter 4, verse 24, it says, Also prohibited women already married, except those whom your right hands possess. So you cannot... Have sex with a married woman, except those whom your right hands possess. Now again, it's a long verse, but that's the one I want to focus on, because I'm going to give you the hadith, because you keep going to the hadith. Let's see if you're going to like the hadith. Sunan Abu Dawood, Sunan Abu Dawood, number 2150. Why was this ayah sent down? It says, married women are unlawful for you, except those whom your right hands possess. Let's see. Sunan Abu Dawood, number 2150. Abu Sayyid al-Khudri said, the Apostle of Allah sent a military expedition to Autas on the occasion of the Battle of Hunayn. They met their enemy and fought with them. They defeated them and took them captives. Some of the companions of the Apostle of Allah were reluctant to have intercourse with the female captives in the presence of their husbands who were unbelievers. So Allah the Exalted sent down the Quranic verse and all married women are forbidden unto you, save those whom your right hands possess. You keep saying Muhammad's character, and he never drank. Okay, here is an ayah that your, your prophet said Allah gave to him, the illiterate prophet, because you said he's illiterate, so he recited it. No, don't worry, those women you took captive, their husbands are alive, don't worry about it. Even though they're married, even though this is adultery and it's rape, Allah said you can go ahead and have sex with them, it doesn't matter. If their husband's alive. Are you telling me, Alhamdulillah, I want you to answer which this verse? question because there's which a lot verse? of... Which verse? Chapter 4, verse 24. Surat An-Nisa, 424. And I just gave you the hadith because you keep going to the hadith. Please don't tell me the hadith is da'if. It's not. Okay, so now are you telling me in front of everyone? This is what I want everyone because there are a lot, a lot of non-Muslims here. And if you read their comments, look, they're saying disgusting. You're telling me a married woman who's been taken captive by Muslims who attack a city is going to say, oh yes, have sex with me even though my husband's alive. This is what we call adultery and rape. And you're okay with this? Surah Tanisa, chapter 4, verse 24. And I gave you that because you kept going hadith, hadith. Now you can't reject the hadith. No, it's not da'if, it's sound. Sunan Abu Dawud 2150. This is why this verse was given. So your God gave your prophet permission these women you've taken captive, they're married, it's okay. You can rape them, have sex with them, sell them. Who cares they're married? That's adultery and rape. And this is the example Wait. you want us to follow? Sunan Abu Dawood, which verse? Sunan Abu Dawood, number 2150. You want me to give you the link? Hold on, let me get you the link. Hold on, I'll get it for you. So that we we see that it's there. Sunan.com, I'm going to get it for you. Sam, send, 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 uh, w yeah. whatever site you're pulling it up on, because uh, I have a different numbering system, slightly different numbering well, system. Well, it should be at 2150. If it's Sunan Abu Dawood, it's still number 2150, right? Uh, no, the, the, uh, in the Darus okay. Salaam edition, it's a little off. It's not off by right. much. But if you, send me, if you send me the link, I can probably put it up yes. on the screen. Well, for you then, the English would be, well, here it even says 2150. It's the Darus Salaam edition. Here you go. But anyway, let me send you the link. Let me give it to you. It's the same thing. But anyway, that's interesting because I have an Sunan da. Okay, now, Dave, let me send it to you. I'm going to send it in the chat right here. Here it goes. Post it for everyone, Dave, if you can. There it goes. Yeah, it's 2150. That's why it's weird. Even the Darus Salaam edition. That's the one on Sunan.com. Right. So I post it so everyone can read it, if you can. You got it, Dave? Uh, yeah, but I'm not used to opening uh, messages on Skype. Let me see what happens all when right. I do this. Well, copy in uh, the link. Copy all right, all right. It. No, 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 I got it. I got it. I got it. All right. So everyone can read why this was quote unquote revealed. All right. So and got it there. Grade is Sahih. And so notice, notice. Uh, I just want everyone to be clear on the flow of events here. 
Um, we have a prophecy in the Quran, and the prophecy isn't very clear. And uh, our Muslim friends tell us, well, we have to go to other sources. Well, great. If we can go to other sources, then when we have a verse like Surah 4, verse 24 of the Quran, saying who's allowed and who's forbidden as a, as a sexual partner, then obviously we can go to the historical background to see what this is about. So Abu Sa'id al-Qudri, we got it here on the screen, said, the Apostle of Allah sent a military expedition to Altas on the occasion of the Battle of Hunayn. They met their enemy and fought with them. They defeated them and took them captives. Some of the companions of the Apostle of Allah were reluctant to have relations with the female captives because of their pagan husbands. So Allah the Exalted sent down the Quranic verse, and all married women are forbidden unto you, save those captives whom your right hand possess. That is to say they are lawful for them when they complete their waiting period. So the, the, just so everyone knows, the historical background here is the Quran had already revealed that Muslims are allowed to have sex with their female captives. But uh, in other situations, there were times when the men had been killed, and so the, all that were left were the women. And so the question was, you know, what about the, what do you do with the women here? Well, it's not adultery because the women's husbands have been killed in battle. But this time they caught, they captured the men and the women, the husbands with their wives. And so Muslim men were worried, hey, is it okay for me to have sex with these women when they're married? Isn't that adultery, Muhammad? And then Allah reveals, Allah reveals, no, that's true. Notice the verse, ladies and gentlemen, all married women are forbidden unto you except the captives whom your right hands possess. So true, you're not allowed to have sex with married women unless you've captured them, which you just have with these women who are still married to their pagan husbands. So, um, Alhamdulillah, what, what, what do you think about this? Yeah, um, so uh, what I want to say about this is obviously I can't um, refute a uh, law. I was just going through the Islamic views and um, I can only do one thing and that is to uh, confirm that. But even though um, it was um, allowed, we have multiple examples that the Prophet said that freeing a slave um, on multiple occasions, he said that freeing a slave would be um, the uh, one of the best of deeds to do and that would uh, earn you a lot of uh, reward. But but this was because at that time, um, even though uh, it, it wasn't like uh, it was suddenly allowed by Prophet Muhammad, you can see a lot of wars in which um, this does happen. And the, um, the so therefore, um, I'm not going to say that it's not allowed in the Sharia. There are, um, like you said, there are multiple hadiths and there must be a reason. And uh, when at the start, I did say that I'm not a scholar. Um, but um, I'm pretty sure there must be an explanation. Also, I just like to uh, repeat one thing. You said that Abdullah did snitch and he did say that it was wrong. I, uh, I just like to correct you with this, Sam. Um, basically, he he was he apostatized and he changed the verses and he tried to change the verses. So over here, you prove that the Quran is right that it would be preserved because he didn't say that Muhammad was lying. Um, peace be upon him was lying when he received. No, he the, did actually. No, no he was lying. I have the hadiths. You want me to read them for you? Yeah, yeah please read them okay, for me. Let me get it for you. Hold on one second. Because you're saying he didn't, and yes, he did. He said that if, if if he allows me to change the message, then I'm inspired just as much as him. Let me get it for you. So no, but please, as I get him for you, explain why did your prophet allow him to change the word of Allah? Because he's not inspired, only the prophet was. So can yeah. you explain that as I get you the hadith? Yeah, yeah Sam, as you're pulling that up, I yeah. just want to, uh, on, on the on the last point we were on, I just wanted to to sort of draw attention to this because th this came up, uh, alhamdulillah, th this, uh, this, uh, this came up in, I believe it was in the last live stream we did, where it was also presented that uh, since Muhammad didn't drink alcohol and, uh, you know, condemned female infanticide, therefore he's this great moral example. But then when we bring up things that are bad, it, it, the, the response is, oh, but those were just, you know, things that people of the time did. But no, notice the problem here, right? If Muhammad drank alcohol and we point out, hey, he drank alcohol, you would simply say, oh, but he did that because that was something that people of the time did. And so it's uh, the, the situation here is we look at Muhammad and he has sex with a, a prepubescent nine-year-old girl. He tells his followers they can have four wives when he gets uh, nine at one time. 
Um, he takes the wife of his own adopted son. He allows his followers to hire prostitutes. He uh, allows his followers to uh, take female captives and, and even if they're married, have sex with them. And Muhammad himself gets caught with uh, his slave girl in the bed of his wife Hafsa. When we point these things out, it's, oh, but you know, you could do these things at the time, whether it's uh, wife beating or sex with a prepubescent girl, any of these things, you know, that, that, that was, those, were, those were issues of the time. But then the response yeah. is, but then the response, you know, when you're defending Muhammad, it's, oh, look at this good thing that he did or this thing that he changed about the society. And this proves that he's he's a good guy. So anyway, the point here is you could pick anyone in history. And the example we talked about last time was I gave the example of an American serial killer named John Wayne Gacy, who raped and killed over 30 boys and young men. So, and I pointed out that John Wayne Gacy used to go to birthday parties as a clown to entertain people. He used to help out with youth organizations like the JCs. He used to help people find jobs. He was a pillar in his community. My point was, look, you could point that out. You could point all of those things out and say, you see, what kind of man would entertain children at birthday parties? What kind of man would help young people get jobs? What kind of man would help all these people in all these different situations? What kind of man? Only a true prophet. Well, if you're going to establish his, his, who he is based on morality, I can't leave out the fact that he raped and killed more than 30 young boys and, and young men, right? You can't leave that out. And so the only, the only point here is, if you have some other great reason for believing in Muhammad and you say, you say, you know, even though Muhammad did all these things that most of the world would, would regard as bad, we still have greater reason that outweighs those things. That would be one thing. But Muslims come and they say, look, Muhammad is so wonderful. He must be a prophet. And we look at all these examples and they say, yeah, 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 yeah. But, you know, he did some of the worst things that, that we can imagine. But that was just for that time. The only point here is you could take anyone. You could take Sam Shimon. You could take me. You could take you. And we could go through and point out something that you've never done in your life, right? Now, I've done a lot of things in my life, especially before I was a Christian. But you could point out David Wood, what, all the other things you've done. You never tortured an old lady for fun. You never, yeah. ever, never once tortured an old lady for fun. And you could make a big deal out of this. David never tortured an old lady for fun. Oh, man, what a great guy. And so it, basically, if you're saying, hey, Muhammad didn't uh, didn't kill girls. He didn't kill his daughters. This makes him great. Well, most of the world's population never killed their daughters. So uh, anyway, that my only point here is if you want to argue for Muhammad, it's got to be on other grounds than morality. Because the yeah, only way yeah. you can make a moral case is okay. by... Yeah. Is by okay. Alhamdulillah, I got that. Can I read it now? Yeah, let, 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 yeah, him, let him respond to this, Sam, and then you go ahead and give that point. Yeah, yeah, yeah because yeah. we're going to read it and yeah. say, yeah, I'm right. So go ahead. Yeah, I think, I think um, uh, David, I think, uh, like you mentioned, uh, Hazrat Taisha's marriage with Prophet, peace be upon him, I think that I would be very unwise to say that you haven't received an explanation from it from several scholars, but even then I'll tell you. Uh, basically, the sources you're talking about say that she was nine years old, Many Muslim scholars disregard that, and many say that she was 13. And when they uh, um, can, can you were give legally a, married, uh, she was 16. Wait, wait, okay. wait I, I'll give you. Please let me finish my point. Okay. And therefore, and therefore, um, we can. And even uh, if we say that he, uh, the, the tradition over there was to ma uh, the woman used to get married at a younger age. Now, let me give you an example. I've heard many people, and you must have heard other people as well, uh, that even. Um, Mary got married when she was um, 12 or 13, right? Um, moreover, um, you said that he had nine wives and there was so I I also had this doubt, but when I searched it, it uh, like not right now, but before, it said that before the revelation uh, of the f uh, four wives permissible, Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam had nine wives and that wasn't out of because he wanted to um, marry them. They were all old age women except um, Hazrat Aisha. They were all older than them and they no, were they all older than them. No. Yeah, they, let, let, um, let, 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 let him finish yeah. and then we're going to go Maryam through. But I, I have to say, yeah. alhamdulillah, yeah. alhamdulillah, yeah. alhamdulillah, yeah. Uh, I, 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 yeah, but I'm, I'm pointing out, alhamdulillah, you are, you are burying your prophet right here because everything exactly. you're saying is literally a click away for, for us to completely refute. Yeah, so just be yeah. careful on this. Go ahead. 
Can okay. we take one yeah, at a time? Yeah, because wait. He, wait, hold on, Hamdullah. You yeah, have too many wait. issues. No, no, wait, wait, no. You, you got to wait, 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 wait. You're no, not letting me complete. Okay. Because Listen, you're going to you're, other you're, issues, Hamdullah. You're changing the subject. Let's go no, back. No, you told me. You told me. Okay. Let's deal with Abisa. Wait. Okay. Sam, 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 Sam. All right. Let, let's not concentrate. Uh, uh, hum, Hamdullah. Well, I will. I'll give you one minute to to finish up your points, and then we're going to respond. Go ahead. One minute. Yeah. And and. Like, like you said um, about the issue of Hazrat Aisha, and like you said about, uh, like I refuted about Mary. You said that the, uh, I said that all the women except Hazrat Aisha were old age women. They weren't, um, uh, and they were old age women, and therefore they were moral responsibilities. Uh, uh, and moreover, Prophet ﷺ never beat his wives. And the verse about beating wives, I think you guys take it as beating wives, but there are different Muslim sects. Some take it as divorce. Some take it as not molesting. So there are different interpretations of that. Okay. Okay. Now, so uh, yeah, I pointed out that everything you just said is false. Yeah. And a yeah, click exactly. away, Sam. Where where did yeah, you yeah. want to start, Sam? Yeah. Yeah. yeah uh, Alhamdulillah. Do me a favor. Listen more than you speak because you made so many mistakes and you're going to embarrass Muhammad. Because the more you talk, the more you destroy Muhammad. So listen. It is a lie when you said Muhammad did not hit his wives. If you had listened to what was it? Friday's lesson discussion. We went through the hadiths where Muhammad struck Aisha in the chest and he caused her pain. But before I get to that, before I get to that, let's deal with Abdullah ibn Abi Sar. We're going to take every one of your points. And if you're going to be honest, you're going to give up on Muhammad. But I want you to catch what you just did. Okay, and I want everyone to hear it. When I said prove your case from the Quran, you ran to the hadith. Now, when we go to the hadith, you now question the hadith because you said, oh, some scholars say... Aisha must not have been nine, she may have been 13, but every hadith under the planet says she was nine. Now you even question the hadith, so it's like there's no winning with you. From the same well, books, the same same yes. Wait, 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 wait Sam, 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 he, he Sam. Just, he, just, he just asked for yes. proof from, yes. from hadith there books of her age. Shani, right? Fortunately, I, I, had these, uh, I had these ready for him. Right. Uh, 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 all right. So, Read it for him. All right, she was nine. And you then can we're gonna go to Abdullah. Yeah, you can you can check out you can check out your uh, screen here. Uh, Alhamdulillah. Um, this is Sahih al Bukhari, fifty one thirty three. By the way, notice. Let, let's go ahead and start at the chapter heading here. Chapter giving. I you. Okay, well I'll, I'll read it to you. The chapter heading in Sahih al Bukhari, fifty one thirty three. The chapter heading is giving one's young children in marriage is permissible. So it's specifically referring this to young children, and then it explains why it's permissible. It says, by virtue of the statement of Allah, and for those who have no monthly courses, i.e. they are still immature, Surah 65, verse 4, and the idda for the girl before puberty, before puberty, before puberty is three months in the above verse. And then we have 5133, which says, narrated Aisha that the prophet wrote the marriage contract with her when she was six years old, and he consummated his marriage when she was nine years old, and then she remained with him for nine years, i.e. till his death. Uh, next next one, 5134, narrated Aisha that the prophet wrote the marriage contract with her when she was six years old and consummated his marriage when she was nine years old. Um, Sahih al-Bukhari, 5158, narrated Urwa, the prophet wrote the marriage contract with Aisha while she was six years old and consummated his marriage with her while she was nine years old, and she remained with him for nine years, i.e. till his death. Bukhari, uh, 6130, narrated Aisha, I used to play with dolls in the presence of the prophet, and my girlfriends also used to play with me. When Allah's messenger used to enter my dwelling place, they used to hide themselves, but the prophet would call them to join and play with me. Notice why Aisha was allowed to continue playing with dolls in the presence of Muhammad when images are forbidden. We have the commentary here. The playing with dolls and similar images is forbidden, but it was allowed for Aisha at that time, as she was a little girl, not yet reached the age of puberty. You mentioned Sahih al-Bukhari and Sahih Muslim. Here's Sahih Muslim, number 3480. It was narrated that Aisha said, the prophet married me when I was six years old and consummated the marriage with me when I was nine years old. And so wherever we look, whether we go to Bukhari, whether we go to Sahih Muslim, whether we go to Sunan Abu Dawud, and by the way, if you want me to keep going, I can keep going. I can I mean, give you exactly. more. I can give you more from Sahih Muslim. I can give you more from Sunan Abu Dawud, Sunan an Nasai, wherever you want to go. This is yeah. always yeah. what it says. And what, David, what, can what I we, read? Yeah, yeah. And, and just what, what we... We I never, just to be clear, what we never, ever, 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 ever find, 
is a source saying Aisha was 13 years old. That's exactly. what modern Muslims say because they know that there are, are people like you, alhamdulillah, who, who, are, who don't think that it's good to have sex with a nine-year-old girl. And so they tell you, no, she may have been 13 years old. We don't know. The, the, the sources aren't very clear. We're pointing out that they're lying to you because the sources are completely, totally, utterly clear over and over and over again. The only inconsistency is some, some sources will say that, that the marriage contract was written when she was six and some will say seven, but the sources across the board say that she was nine when Muhammad consummated the marriage, had sex with her. And as I pointed out, we even have, we even have plenty, uh, plenty of commentary showing that she hadn't reached puberty yet. What are your thoughts? Can, Sam? I mean, listen, I'm gonna read Ibn Kathir now. This is Ibn Kathir and his The Life of the Prophet Muhammad, Al Sira and Nabawiya, Volume 2. I got the English translation by Trevor Lagasik, Volume 2. And this is what he says in pages 93, 94. Alhamdulillah, like I said, listen a little more so you can see these arguments that they thought you are bad. Ibn Kathir, this is what he says. His statement, he contracted marriage with Aisha when she was six. Okay. His statement, he contracted marriage with Aisha when she was six, thereafter consummating marriage with her when she was nine, is not disputed by anyone. Let me repeat, is not disputed by anyone and is well established in the Sahih collections of traditions and elsewhere. So Ibn Kathir says, your Muslim scholars, they're liars and they're deceivers, because Ibn Kathir is saying at his time, this is 700 years after the death of your prophet. No one disputes it. All the ulama, because it's based on the Sahih narration. She was nine when your prophet had sex with her, and he was 54 years old. So, so please. Yeah our, 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 yeah, our only point here is um, this is a modern invention. So this is Ibn Kathir, uh, considered by many to be the greatest commentator of all time. And he spent his entire life studying the Muslim sources and previous commentators. And he said, there's no one, there's no one who denies that Aisha was nine, but we find Muslims today doing it. And why? Because this is a modern invention because people today generally believe that it's wrong. All right, Sam, on the related issue, uh, do we know that Mary was 12 to 12 or 13 when, uh, yeah. when she was married? Absolutely nowhere are we told that she was 12 or 13. And if you read Luke very carefully, Mary is a mature virgin maiden who's mature enough to understand how children are created. How do we know? Because if you go to Luke 1, verses 34 and 35, David, when the angel says she's going to give birth to the son, whose name is Jesus, who is great, the son of God, she goes, how can this be seeing I have known no man? Does that sound like an 8-year-old or a 10-year-old or someone who doesn't know about the birds and the bees? Hmm. So she's mature enough to understand Women only have children if they have sex. Well, I'm a virgin, even though I'm betrothed. I haven't touched a man. How can I conceive? And then Gabriel tells her, because the Holy Spirit will come upon you, cause you to conceive supernaturally, miraculously. And then she's mature enough, David, that she can then travel to her relative's house, Elizabeth, and enter the home, and then Elizabeth greet her and call her the mother of my Lord. So whatever age Mary was, she wasn't a young girl prepubescent, who hadn't reached puberty, who wasn't psychologically fit to be married, playing with dolls, and a 54-year-old man jumping in bed with her. She was a mature Jew Jewish virgin who knew enough that the only way you can have children is through sexual intercourse, but I'm a virgin, and that's why Gabriel had to say, no, you're going to conceive as a virgin by the power of the Holy Spirit. The fact that Muslims have to take Mary, who conceived as a virgin, and gave birth to the holy, pure Son of God. Even the Quran says, even the Quran agrees she was mature. Because if you go to Surah al Maryam, chapter 19, read Ayah 16 to 21, because if you read verse 19, the Spirit says, I'm only a messenger of your Lord, sent to give you a pure son. And then the Quran has Mary saying, how can this be, seeing I do not know a man? Even the Quran agrees she was mature enough to know how children are produced. She was no little girl playing with dolls, playing on swings, and a grown 54-year-old man jumping in bed with her, which is what Muhammad did to Aisha. It is an insult when you do this to the mother of Christ, 
keep bringing her down to the level of Aisha and Muhammad, it is insult because that means not only are you attacking the Bible, you're attacking your Quran. Please stop yeah. disrespecting the mother of the Lord. Yeah, so uh, we, we actually, there, there's an actually a, a deeper point here, uh, Handala, than, than anything we're saying here. And, and that is, we know, and, and I pointed this out in a video about Yasser Qadi. Yasser Qadi said that, that uh, Muslims, when they find out about things, then they go look to their leaders and apologists, and then they, they, they memorize the responses that they give. The, the main point we'd be trying to make here is uh, we understand that, you know, when Muslims find out about Muhammad and Aisha, they, and, and all of these other issues, they want to go to their Muslim leaders and apologists and say, how do I answer this? And then you hear, oh, you know, Aisha was 13. We can't really tell from, from the Muslim sources, but Mary was 12 uh, as well, according to Christianity and so on. What we're trying to, to show you is anything these guys tell you, you need to investigate because they keep, tell, they keep giving you false information. We don't have a single reliable source telling us how old Mary was. She sounds like a mature, a mature young woman. That's what she sounds like. If you want to say, no, she's eight or 10 or 12 or something like that, you need to give a case and there, there just is none because we don't have any sort of source on her eight. We do have tons and tons and tons of sources on Aisha. And so any scholar who says otherwise neither needs to back it up. Uh, Sam, on the, on the issue of Muhammad's nine wives, yeah, Muhammad had nine wives. It sounded like it sounded like uh, Hamdullah was saying that you know he had these wives before the revelation of Surah four, yeah, no. and we got a couple of problems here. What do you, what do you think? Yeah, yeah, and make sure when we get to that also the Abdullah ibn Abi Sar, because the non-Muslims need to hear how embarrassing the story is. Yeah, as far as that's concerned, chapter thirty-three, verse fifty, even tells you that Muhammad had the wives after the Quranic prohibition. Because if you go to chapter thirty-three, verse fifty, right there it tells you that the prohibition having two, three, or four wives, if you can be fair with them, was already revealed, quote-unquote, because it, it, the Quran reminds Muhammad and the Muslims that this is a privilege given to Muhammad, not to the rest. Here, let me read it. 3350, it's right here. O Prophet, chapter 33, verse 50. O Prophet, lo, we have made lawful unto thee thy wives unto whom you have paid their dowries and those whom your right hand possess, of those whom Allah has given you as spoils of war, and the daughters of your uncle on your father's side, and the daughters of your aunts on your father's side, and the daughters of your uncle on your mother's side, <laughs> and the daughters of your aunts on your mother's side, who immigrated with you, and a believing woman, if she gives herself unto the prophet, and the prophet desire to ask her in marriage, a privilege for you only, not for the rest of believers. We are aware of what we enjoin upon them concerning their wives and those whom their right hands possess. Now, David, how in the world could the Quran say, we are aware of what we've told them, the others, the believers, mm. when it comes to their wives and what their right hands possess, if that was not already revealed to them, they can only have up to four wives and as many as their right hands possess. How is that possible? Yeah, uh, Hamdullah, so if you went to if you went to a, a Muslim website or, or you went to your imam or something like that and asked him to explain why Muhammad had nine wives and if he told you, yeah, but that was before the revelation. And uh, apart from that, Sam, uh, didn't Muhammad, when... when, when when the four wife limit came, yes, did Muhammad tell his companions, "Hey, if you have more than four, you got to divorce. You yes. got to divorce some of them." Yes, there was a companion who had more than four wives. He goes, "Divorce and keep only four, in order to meet the restriction of the Quran." Yes, and, and that's, if that's, uh, yeah, and uh, Hamdullah, if you are if you are told that these were all old women, well, if you mean older than Aisha, yes, Aisha was the youngest. But let me just give you. Uh, a, a basic rundown, and there are some inconsistencies on these lists, but uh, Khadija, so she was officially 40 when Muhammad married her. Uh, Sauda, 50 when Muhammad married her. Those were the those were the oldest. Um, Aisha, 9 when Muhammad had sex with her. Hafsa, 22. Zainab, 30. Uh, the, the, the first no. Zainab, first uh, Zainab, Zainab you, 30. How can, you confirm, how can you confirm that Muhammad did it when, when uh, Muhammad P.P. upon him did it when Aisha was nine years old, when you're saying that all of the others were just married? Is there any what? proof? I mean, maybe... Uh, what I, do you mean? I don't know what you're saying. She said that... Yeah, he, what are you asking? David said that the, he married the other woman when they were 50 years old, and then he said that he had sex with... Uh, Aisha when she was nine year old, nine years old. Uh -huh. I mean, maybe, that, no. yeah. where does that say that? Show me that Hadith. They just said consummated the marriage when she was nine. Consummated that means, means that, that he, means legal nikah. That does no, not mean that, that they, no. It no, means no. 
Do you know what consummated means? Yeah, I mean, I'm here, Don. Am yeah, I? No, yeah. Con con consummated. That's when consummated means have sex. Yes, that's the Arabic word. Yeah, you. So she's official. She's married to him when she's six or seven. That's that's when the contract is made. He consummates the marriage when she's nine years old. That's when that's when they actually have sex. That's when she's taken. That's when she's taken to his house. In fact, if you if you go to the online translations of Sunan Abu Dawood, they they don't even say consummated. They say had sex with her. Yeah, so okay. basically, uh, have these you are given your us the link of it? A link to what? You can, you can, you can go to. No, a link, a link, a link to the this where it says that the uh, marriage consummated at age nine. We just gave you all the hadiths. It says she was six, and he consummated she's nine, and then she was taken to his house when she was nine, playing with dolls. Yeah, Sam. Sam, why don't you why don't you share the link? Share the link to uh, one of your yeah. articles on okay, on this. But yeah, Sam. Account. Sam okay. gives the articles. Uh, I mean, Sam yeah. gives the hadith references. But uh, okay, yeah, this is there. this information is not is not hard to find. So so going again, going through going down the list of, of these wives. So the first Zainab thirty, uh, Um Um Yasalma, who was twenty six. Zainab bint Josh was thirty eight. Uh, Juria twenty. Um Habiba uh, thirty six. Uh, Mary the cop seventeen. Safiya bin Hayy bin Al bin Akab seventeen, uh, Rehana not sure, and Maimuna thirty six. So it's basically there's a range going from nine, and you have a couple more girls in their teens there, going all the way up to to Sauda as the oldest, at fifty years old. So it seems Muhammad uh, wasn't too picky about whether girls were younger than him, much younger than him, or or older. In fact, into, uh, um, Hamda, I don't know if you know this, but we have all the references, but time is fleeting. In fact, Safiya, she was so beautiful. How many slaves did Muhammad give to have her as his wife? Because uh, Dihya ibn al-Kalbi took her, Safiya. And then Muhammad was told about her status and beauty. How many slaves did he give Dihya? To have Safiya as his wife, because you talked about Muhammad freeing slaves, but we have hadiths that Muhammad owned slaves, sold slaves, and black slaves. How many slaves did Muhammad give up for Safiya to have her? Do you know? Uh, are you there? Uh, maybe he's looking something up. Okay. Yeah. Um, so, uh, are you speaking? Yeah. Yeah, I'm saying, yeah, how many slaves did he give up for her? To have her. Do you want me to give you the information? Yeah, just, just go ahead just go and share yeah. it, Sam. Okay, again, this comes from Sunan Abu Dawood. Now, Wait, um, yeah. Yeah, yeah, you're clear. You can speak. Yes, okay. what we Sunan Abu Dawood. Yeah, okay, okay, I'm going to read the hadith now. Sunan Abu Dawood. Anna said, a beautiful slave girl fell to Dihya. The Apostle of Allah purchased her for seven slaves. He gave up seven slaves. Dihya, here's seven slaves. Give me Safiya. You okay with that? We're not hearing any responses. Uh, yeah, because he's probably looking up on Google. He's trying to find something on Google. Maybe I don't know. That's fine. That's fine. Um, so and, anyway, just to uh, just to recap here, since we're 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 not getting a response, the, the point here is. Um, Notice how, how no, this. No, I, I, I was hitting. I was hitting. Okay. Was hitting. Yeah. So, so the, anyway, the, yeah. the the only point here, uh, Hamdullah, is that you're the one who brought this up. If you just, you know, if we just stuck with prophecies or something like that, we wouldn't be talking about this right now. But you brought up Muhammad's character as as evidence, and the evidence was, well, you know, he didn't, uh, he, you know, he he was against killing daughters and something else like alcohol or something like that. And we go through all this other stuff about him having sex with a prepubescent girl and violating his own revelations and uh, taking the wife of his own adopted son and uh, all these different things. And the response is, no, 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 no. Muhammad didn't do any of that. He didn't beat his wife. Well, Aisha said he did. So he Muslim 2127. So it's it's everything you're saying. Every Everything you're saying to us about Muhammad is false, according to your own sources, when we talk about his character. This by itself wouldn't mean that he's he's not a prophet if you had some great evidence that, that he was a prophet. Point is, in Islam, 
all we ever find are problems. We never find we never find any actual solid evidence that he's a prophet. And so the, the point we're trying to make here is when your leaders, when your apologists, when your scholars are giving you this information, it's you don't seem to be going to very reliable sources here because everything they're telling you is false according to your own sources. Now, um, uh, and, and I'm sorry, I'm sorry, we, we've been kind of rushing. We're rushing because we're sort of w winding down to the end of it. Yeah. Uh, you um, heard, can we do the Abdullah ibn right? Abisar before he leaves? Yeah, before though, can I yeah, do yeah, Abdullah yeah. ibn Abisar? Yeah, 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 one second, Sam. So we'll do the Abdullah uh, uh, Abisar, and then um, yeah. uh, Abdullah also brought up the issue of miracles. So, well, it's no problem. We could we could go, you know, we, we can we can go over a little bit, but we did want to address that point because he, he brought it up. So uh, go ahead, Sam. Yeah, let's see. Let me give you the link so you can see it. This is again the link for Abdullah ibn Abisar. Here it is, David. If you want to click on it and post it, it comes from <clears throat> Azbab al Nuzul. Azbab al Nuzul, because I want to read it. So I'm going to read it. You ready? Because you said no, no, he didn't accuse Muhammad of lying and making it up. So are you? Can I read it for you? Are you ready? Um, um, yeah, Abdullah. Hang on yeah, one, yeah, yeah. one one second, Sam. One second, Sam. I, because I can get this up on the screen and All then. Right. Let me see. I have the technology, and here we go. Okay, so it's on the screen. All right, when you put it on, because there's a delay for them. So hold on a second. And I can't see it on my screen either for some reason. But anyway, it's going to come up. No, okay, guys. You you you, you you probably see. Yeah, you you see. You'll see what they see if you look at the screen. But yeah, it's yeah, up yeah. on the screen. Okay, guys. This again is altafsir.com. Al uh, It's I'm sorry. It comes from Asbab al Nuzul by Al Wahdi. Al Wahdi, as Baba Nuzul. For those of you who don't know what the as Baba Nuzul means, the occasion of revelation. Occasion of revelation. It's in front of your eyes. I'm going to read it. I want you to see what it says. Who is guilty of more wrong than he who forgeth a lie against Allah or saith, I am inspired? Pay attention. I am inspired. Who is this addressing? Who's the one saying, I'm inspired? I receive Wahi. Okay, let's read. This was revealed about the liar, uh, Musalima al-Hanafi. This man was a soothsayer who composed rhyme speech and claimed prophethood. He claimed that he was inspired by Allah. Now watch this. This verse was revealed about Abdullah ibn Sa'd ibn Abisar. This verse was revealed about Abdullah ibn Sa'd ibn Abisar. Notice this story, how interesting, especially for the non-Muslims. Someone may be shocked to read this. This man had declared his faith in Islam. And so the Messenger of Allah called him one day to write something for him. Now remember, Alhamdulillah said he had so many scribes they used to write for him. Well, Abisad was one of them. Okay, now, when the verses regarding the believers were revealed, verily we created man from a product of wet earth. The Prophet dictated, dictated them to him, these words. When he reached up to and then produced it as another creation, Abdullah expressed his amazement at the position of man's creation by saying, so blessed be Allah, the best of creators. So remember, this is Abisar's words. Blessed be Allah, the best of creators. Christians, listen to Mud's reaction. The Messenger of Allah said, this, Abdullah's last expression, is how it was revealed to me. Abdullah, what you said, that's how it's revealed to me. So write it. At this point, doubt crept into Abdullah. He said, if Muhammad is truthful, then I was inspired just as he was. Basic logic. Wait, if you're truthful and you receive revelation, that means I'm inspired too, because I just said words that you said was revealed. I'm a prophet too, Muhammad. Okay? Now, but watch what he goes on to say. Watch what he says. Now, notice what he said. If Muhammad is truthful, then I was inspired just as he was. And if he's lying, I have uttered exactly what he did utter. So if he's a liar, then he's no more inspired than I am. Now, watch what happens. Hence, Allah's words, and who saith, I will reveal the light of that which Allah hath revealed. The man renounced Islam. This is also the opinion of Ibn Abbas, according to the report of Al-Kalbi. Abdul Rahman Ibn Abdan informed us, Muhammad Ibn Abdullah Ibn Nuaym, Muhammad Ibn Yaqub Al-Umawi, Ahmad Ibn Abdul Jabr, Yunus Ibn Bukair, Muhammad Ibn Ishaq, man, his name, Shurabil mm -hmm. bin Sa'ad, who said, this verse was revealed about Abdullah Ibn Sa'ad Ibn Abisar. The latter said, I will reveal the like of that which Allah has revealed. So he's mocking Muhammad. Hey, I'm inspired too, just like Allah has inspired you. So what happens? What does Muhammad want to do to him? Okay, watch here. And renounce Islam. When the Messenger of Allah entered Mecca, this man fled to Uthman ibn Affan, who was his milk brother, his foster brother. 
Uthman hid him until the people of Mecca felt safe. He then took him to the Messenger of Allah and secured an amnesty for him. You said that he didn't accuse Muhammad of lying. Yes, he did. He goes, if he's inspired, then I'm inspired. But if he's lying, then he's no more inspired than me. And I, I revealed words like Allah revealed words to Muhammad. So, alhamdulillah, convince everyone here, convince everyone here, yeah. that when yeah. Muhammad took the words of this man, Abi Sa'd, and told him, ah, what you said, praise be Allah, bless be Allah, the best of creators, that how, that's how it was revealed. How did this man recite Quran when he's not a prophet, and Muhammad take his words and make it part of the Quran? Yeah, just so uh, just yeah. so everyone understand. Uh, uh, hey, one second. Just just so everyone understands the point that's being made here. So this is one of Muhammad's scribes because you know there's a lot of names and a lot of words on the page there. Uh, this is one of Muhammad's early scribes. Muhammad is receiving a revelation about Allah creating, and his scribe Ibn Abi Sar, his scribe shouts out, "Blessed is Allah, the best of those who create." And Muhammad said, "Yeah, yeah, yeah. Put that in there. That's how, that's how that's how it's revealed." So Abdullah's reasoning was, "Wait a minute. If if that's how it's supposed to be in the Quran, that's what I said. I didn't get that from Muhammad. I said I blurted that out. So if he's a prophet, then I'm a prophet because that came from me, not from Muhammad. So he's saying if Mom, if if." if <laughs> His, his reasoning is basically, if Muhammad's a prophet, then I'm a prophet. I know I'm not a prophet, therefore he's not a prophet, right? So if Muhammad's a prophet, then I have to be a prophet too, because we both receive words that are in the Quran. And ladies and gentlemen, you can go to your Quran. Abdul, the, there are words in your Quran that come not through the revelation of Muhammad, but through Abdullah ibn Abisar, a guy who apostatized. He left Islam because he said, there's no way this guy's a prophet when he's letting me write the Quran. <laughs> Go ahead. Yeah. Uh, David, mm -hmm. um, just so we're clear, you said that we were ending about in uh, half an hour. Um, I don't have a, um, even though I have light, my charging port is not working. So you said that after half an hour, the session will end. So is this my last turn or do we have other turns? Um, no, no, no. I, I mentioned. I mentioned it's okay if we if we go a little uh, a little over. So if you wanted if you wanted us uh, if you wanted to discuss very quickly the um, the point about Muhammad performing miracles, we could. And uh, again, we're we're going to make sure you you get to you get to speak last here. So it's what do you want to do? Do, yeah. do? do you want to end? Okay. Do you want to end now, or do you so, want to discuss the miracles? So uh, what I uh, what I want because obviously we're all here to discuss what is the truth. We're not here to arrogantly. So I'd like Sam to discuss the point about the miracles, and then I can end. Okay. Yeah, um, this goes back to what I was saying earlier that the Quran claims that explains everything in detail. You keep going to sources that are 100 to 200 years after the time Muhammad supposedly died. And even when I go to those sources, when they contradict what you believe about Muhammad, you'll either question them and say it's not true, it's weak. So it's not really even the sources that you believe. But now coming back to the issue, I am fully aware that your sources that came over 100 years after the death of Muhammad attribute miracles to Muhammad. But this is, again, proof that your sources are corrupt unless you believe the Quran is corrupt. Because a Muslim, a Muslim, will give priority to the Quran. So if there's a source that contradicts the Quran, the Muslim will say that source is wrong. I'm not going to give you just a few verses where the Quran repeatedly says, repeatedly says, no miracles given to Muhammad. He was not sent with any signs. He is just a warner. Signs are with Allah, but Allah did not give him any signs. Here, let me just give you several of many. Chapter 13, verse 27 of the Quran. Chapter 13, verse 27. The unbelievers say, why has a sign not been sent down upon him from his Lord? So they want a miracle. Hey, why come there's no miracles? What is the answer? He doesn't say, I shown you many miracles. I split the moon. Water came out of my fingertips. You know, like I had, my fingertips were like a water hose. He didn't say any of that. Here's what he says. Say, Allah leads astray whomever he wills, and he guides to whom he wants that are penitent, repentant. So that's this first answer. Here's another one. Chapter 11, verse 12 of the Quran. Chapter 11, verse 12. Chapter 11, verse 12. Then it may be that you will give up a part of what is revealed to you, and your breasts will become straightened by it, because they say, Why has not a treasure been sent down upon him, or an angel come with him? You are only a warner. 
and Allah is custodian over all things. That's all you are. You're a warner. You don't bring angels or miracles. None of that. How about chapter 17, verse 59? Chapter 17, verse 59 of the Quran. Not prevented us. Nothing stopped us from sending down signs. But the ancients, those before you, cried lies to them. And we brought Thamud, the she-camel, visible, but they did it wrong. And we do not send the signs except to frighten. So what's the excuse? What's the point of giving you miracles? We gave miracles to the prophets before, and they rejected them. So you're going to reject them too. So tough luck, no miracles. And if you're still not convinced, here, chapter 28, verse 48. Now they're asking, him, can you give us a sign like Moses? Chapter 28, verse 48. Yet when the truth came to them from ourselves, they said, why has not been given the like of what Moses was given? Wait, you're saying you're a prophet like the prophets before you? How come Allah didn't give you a sign like he gave Moses? But they, did they not disbelieve also what was, Moses was given before? They said a pair of sorcerers mutually supporting each other. They said we disbelieve in both. So repeatedly, no signs are given to you because the signs that were given to the prophets before you, they rejected them. So what's the point? They're going to reject you too. And ironically, you quoted chapter 29, verse 49 of the Quran, but you didn't quote all of it because according to the Quran, the only miracle Allah gave Muhammad is the Quran, and that's all he needed. He didn't need anything else. Here you go. Let me read it for you. They say, this is chapter 29, 49 to 50, 48 to 50, but I'm going to skip to 50 and 51. If you want the context, chapter 29, verses 48 to 51, yep. but I'll skip, right, to 50, 51. They say, why have signs not been sent down upon him from his Lord? The signs are only with Allah. I am only a plain warner. That's all I am. What? Is this not sufficient for them? that we sent down upon you a book that is recited to them. So according to the Quran, Allah could send signs. He didn't. I'm just a warner. And this book is sufficient sign. But my friend, Alhamdulillah, I hope you understand the point. If you say he did miracles besides the Quran, you again prove the Quran is a lie because the Quran says you don't need any other miracles. This Quran is all you need and it's all you get. But if you tell me he did more signs, that means the Quran is a lie. Because the Quran wasn't all he needed. He needed other signs. So what is the Quran talking about? So go ahead. Yeah. Uh, so this is my last turn. Uh, no, let, let, let me go ahead and comment that because I don't I don't want to okay. comment. I don't want to comment after you. I mean, I, I will, but I'll just be telling people bye and, and so on. But um, okay. yeah, so so the, the, the thoughts here, uh, Abdullah, is that if we're examining, if we're examining miracles, right? Um, if you're saying someone performed a miracle, you generally want as early sources as possible. But our earliest source here is the Quran. And the, the Quran repeatedly says that Muhammad's, Muhammad didn't perform miracles. His, his only miracle is the Quran. And yet we go to much later sources that come from more than a century afterwards. And then we start, fi we start finding these miracle stories. And so if we're thinking to ourselves, look, what, was Muhammad really going around performing miracles? Because these sources, Muslims themselves tell us you can't really trust these sources uh, too much. And whenever it's inconvenient for them, they tell us, nope, that was made up. But, uh, but we're supposed to take these miracle claims seriously when these miracle claims contradict the earliest source, which is the Quran. So when what, what we find when we look at the Quran is over and over and over again, the unbelievers are challenging Muhammad. Why aren't you performing any miracles? Why are you not performing any miracles? How come you're the one who doesn't perform miracles? And then Allah is constantly defending Muhammad. Well, the reason he's not performing miracles is this. The reason he doesn't perform miracles is that, which wouldn't make sense if Muhammad's going around performing miracles. If Muhammad were going around performing miracles, the response would be, what are you talking about, you stubborn rebels? He's performing miracles all the time. He's shooting water out of his fingers. He's making milk. He's making food. What's wrong with you? He split the moon. Come on. Are you, bl you guys blind? Right? That would be the response. And yet, that's not what the Quran says. The Quran repeatedly makes excuses. But we know, we know that even during the time of Muhammad, he's repeatedly being challenged for miracles. And this didn't stop after Muhammad's death. Instead, the Muslims go out and they're constantly trying to convince Jews and Christians and everyone else, Muhammad is a prophet. And the first question Jews and Christians are asking is what's what, what miracles did he perform and at first uh, they obviously would have given the explanation of the Quran well you know he couldn't have given miracles because earlier generations didn't believe the miracles therefore none for you but that didn't work out very well um, saying hey look look at our lovely Arabic calligraphy just wasn't a persuasive argument 
to Jews and Christians. And so all of a sudden, we start finding all of these miracle stories in the Muslim sources uh, in an atmosphere when people are inventing and fabricating stories about Muhammad left and right. Uh, at, at the end of the day, they're just not stories that we can take very, uh, very seriously. Now, before your final words, uh, we did want to respond to a, a comment here. Shoka said, why are you guys debating some 18-year-old Pakistani kid debate someone your own age? I have to re-emphasize, we have invited the entire world. Any Muslim scholar can join us on our live stream. If Zakir Naik or Shabir Ali or Yasser Qadi or any of these guys want to join us, they can. If the internet apologists like Anand Rashid and Muhammad Hijab and Ali Dawa and all these guys want to join us, they can. But at the same time, if a if a if a if a young Muslim wants to join us and have a discussion, that's fine. That's fine with us. And so we'll we'll have a nice friendly discussion and and go through his points. I mean, keep in mind you're saying don't have a discussion. An 18 year old isn't ready, but and yet uh, a nine year old Aisha was old enough for marriage. Come on, guys, try to try to be consistent here. Hello. <laughs> all right. So 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 I just wanted to say, Shoka, show as we pointed out at the beginning, we have all the respect in the world for these for these young Muslims who are exactly. willing to come on here and explain why they're Muslims. And uh, they're acknowledging that they're not scholars. So uh, don't think that if they couldn't answer something that therefore it can't be an it, it can't be answered or something like that. But uh, the point is we have all the respect in the world for them having the courage to come on here and explain why they're why why they believe what they believe. And we're happy to go through their points. We're happy to to to, to treat them like 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 grown-ups who who are who are capable of discussing their points. And so, uh, and, and just so you know, I mean, 18, 19, 20 years old, this is when I was wrestling with a lot of my ideas. So no, pro no, no problem there. And now, uh, alhamdulillah, yeah. you, you take as much time as you need to, uh, to yep. go you got the final close the Yep. yep. Uh, thank you very much. Um, just before I start um, giving my final remarks, uh, David and Sam, yesterday when I um, told my friends that I was going to um, have a discussion with all of you, so um, I pretty much everyone was like, no, um, like you're not qualified enough and maybe you could misrepresent Islam. And so the thought came to my mind that, yes, but if I do uh, misrepresent Islam, but then Islam itself tells us that we need to research and we need to find um, other things. And therefore, uh, that's why I, uh, uh, when I saw David's uh, previous videos, the word debate wasn't mentioned, but discussion. Mm -hmm. And therefore, um, I think um, there's one verse of the Bible or one line that I find truly amazing, and that is that the truth shall prevail. And therefore, with all of these belief systems, I think most people want to get married. Um, most people have a goal of achieving something. But what I want to achieve is I want to die. Why do I want to die is because only then would we know the true uh, we, we know the truth of what is right. And I mean, we uh, everybody thinks that what they're doing is right. I think as a Muslim that my religion is 100% uh, perfect. You think as a Christian that your religion is 100% perfect. But the only physical proof that we are going to get um, is that when we die and when we know that who the true Lord is. And therefore, uh, I think this discussion was very important for me because... Uh, I think the things that you have told me, now I'll go and research about them. And um, obviously, uh, like I, like even David said before that, um, I'll just tell you my age. I'm not even 18. I'm si I just turned 16 years oh, old. Oh, wow. <laughs> yeah. Good man. Good man. Good. Yeah. <laughs> and um, therefore, um, I think it's very important that we um, do research in order to that. But um, even uh, before uh, ending, I'd just like to refute to them. Um, uh, uh, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam didn't have miracles like Jesus, for example, healing the dead or something like that. But I think Allah did give him miracles um, to, help, uh, to help him. And uh, like you said that um, I was... Uh, uh, studying your previous video when uh, you uh, when you said that uh, when there was a scholar from uh, india i believe you said that if it's not human when he recited either kursi you said it can be said so i think there's one uh, reason uh, for me to say that you at least believe that it's not um, written by a human uh, therefore, um, when you discussed, um, because um, understand that uh, even when you discussed about Abdullah, 
um, <clears throat> you said that um, he said that Prophet Muhammad was a uh, poet and he was saying um, all of that wrong. So um, understand that uh, we Muslims think uh, that Prophet Muhammad was an illiterate person and it was impossible for him to uh, simply write the, uh, or uh, even write the entire Quran without having, um, I mean, you did mention, David, that he had a Christian slave, but understand that the Christian slave was not a scholar of Christianity, and therefore there was no other way for him to read or only um, hear and write the entire Quran, and therefore mentioning a lot of aspects um, in there. And um, moreover, um, at the end, I'd just like to say that... Um, uh, or th this is the uh, question which I asked in the first um, case as well. Um, that uh, I said that even uh, uh, even though we believe that Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam is a, um, a true prophet, even if you guys don't think he isn't, then why would God not humiliate him? Why would God make him successful? Because if you look at stats, uh, population stats uh, by 2050, the number of Muslims will be more than the number of Christians. So uh, therefore, at the end, the uh, ultimately, the kingdom of uh, Allah or Muhammad is being established rather than uh, Christians or your Jesus. So um, I think that if uh, someone was a false prophet and was claim or attributing something wrong to God, then uh, God would um, obviously humiliate him or would not let him live. There have been many examples of false prophets whom God has not left. And I think uh, who has been a, a true prophet, God has made him successful. And uh, therefore, um, with that, um, I'd like to end. I think it was a very, um, I don't know for you guys, because you guys must have been hearing these questions for um, years. You guys have... Yeah, uh uh, if someone asks me who's a better debater, I'd obviously tell them that it's you guys because you've been debating from 20 years. But um, if you ask what my motive was to come over here, it was not to get bashed by you guys, but it was to ultimately we all go in the search for truth. And um, inshallah, God willingly, may Allah guide you all and uh, we will all know the truth one day when we die. Thank you very much. Hey, uh, uh, uh. Abdullah, uh, I'll give I'll, I'll give you. Uh, I realize that you you did bring up some points that we never got to, so I don't want to go into any kind of detail on there. I just want to give you a quick general idea, and then you can say something else uh, as uh, if you if you have any final words. But uh, I, I, you're saying that you wanted to get this to learn more and stuff like that. So I just want to give you a kind of general idea of these of these points that we didn't actually get to. Um, you. You pointed out that Sam was saying, well, you know, maybe maybe Satan could inspire it. That's actually coming from the Muslim sources when Muhammad, when Muhammad, we're, so we're, we're using a an objection that comes from Muhammad. Muhammad was sure. asked, what about these, what about these soothsayers and people who are predicting the future? Should we believe them? And Muhammad said, no, because they can get their revelations from jinn. They can get them their revelations from evil spirits. So when someone, you know, points to mathematical marvels or something in the Quran, um, we could discuss the mathematical marvels and whether they're actually miraculous or something, but but it's it's a quicker response to say, well, even according to your own prophet, we shouldn't take that as evidence because if jinns if jinn can give revelations, then perhaps we shouldn't take uh, that kind of thing seriously. So there's that. Uh, you you mentioned that you know how could Muhammad uh, you know come up with this entire book if he's illiterate. Um, Supposedly Homer, supposedly Homer, the Greek poet, Homer was illiterate, and yet he put together the Iliad and the Odyssey. Why? Because he put it together in sort of poetic meter and in oral cultures, they would write entire books um, from memory and share them, especially if you're doing it over time, revealing little parts at a time. Uh, this was known, especially in oral cultures. It's hard for us. You're, you're, you're too young, alhamdulillah. To remember, me and Sam remember when we didn't have smartphones that have everyone's phone phone number memorized. We remember when we're 17 or 18, if you wanted to call your friends, you just had 30 or 40 phone numbers memorized, right? You had them in your head. Now I can barely re memorize my own phone number, right? Because we don't do it anymore. So the culture has changed. If you go back to an oral culture where they emphasize these things, um, then that's pretty normal. Um, as far as uh, Muhammad not being humiliated, then, I mean, one, I think I think he was. He died a horrible, agonizing death. Um, you know, 
complaining that he could feel his aorta being severed, which is exactly the disgraceful death that the Quran said a false prophet would have. But apart from that, there are, there are lots of there are lots of prophets who are successful for years. So Joseph Smith, I mean, one of the fast, you know, Mormonism has been spreading for many years. It only it, it only it got started much more recently than Islam. So it's a smaller religion, but uh, spreading very, very rapidly. Um, we wouldn't say that, therefore, since Joseph Smith survived many years and only died at the end, that he must therefore be a prophet. Same thing with Mirza Ghulam Ahmed. I mean, he Muslims don't want to regard him as a prophet, and yet he... Uh, Ahmadis would say he was successful. Look, look how rapidly his movement is spreading around the world. Look how many uh, people are converting to uh, to the Ahmadiyya movement and so on. So it, it's basically I'm, I'm I'm relating this to what you said that you know the we would actually have to die in order to get conclusive proof. Well, in one sense, you know, as far as you know, that would that would obviously. Uh, add something, actually experiencing the afterlife or something like that. But uh, I, I, I do believe that God has given us our brains, God has given us our intellects, and he's given us the ability through his revelations to know the truth. And so I believe if we keep seeking, if we keep seeking, God will bless us to find them. So those would be my words for it. Yeah. Um, Sam, did you don't, have something? Did you have yeah, something? And then we'll, and then we'll, give, add, and yeah. we'll give Hamdullah. Yeah, sorry uh, about that. Yeah. Because it's not we don't want to answer you. It's the time ran out. We want to be sensitive. You kept saying, how would Muhammad know this? All this information. He wasn't literate. All you need to do, and I'm just going to read a few names. All you need to do, go read the Mufassirun, the commentators on chapter 16, verse 103. They admit that Muhammad in Mecca used to meet with Christians, and he would listen to them read their religious scriptures and he would learn from them i'm just going to give you a few tafsir al jalalain tafsir al jalalain and verily walaqad is for confirmation we know that they say it is only a human that is teaching him the quran this was a christian blacksmith from whom the prophet used to visit frequently that's tafsir al jalalain Tanwir and Miqbas min Tafsir ibn Abbas on 16103. And we know well, O Muhammad, the disbelievers of Mecca say, only a man, Jabir and Yasir. They even give you the names of who the Christians were who were teaching Muhammad the deen. Teach him the Quran. The speech of them, whom they falsely incline and scribe to, is outlandish because they speak Hebraic. A final one, Ali ibn Ahmed al Wahdi, which we just cited, Asbab al Nuzul, Asbab al Nuzul. Okay, now watch here. And we know, well, that they say only a man teacheth him. The speech of him at whom they falsely hint at is outlandish. Abu Nasir Ahmed ibn Ibrahim al-Muzaqi. Ab Abu Abdullah Mu Muhammad ibn Hamdan al-Zahid. Abdullah ibn Muhammad ibn Abdul Aziz. Abu Hisham al rifai ibn Fudail. Hussein. Abdullah ibn Muslim who said, we own two Christian youths from the people of Ain Tamir, one called Yasser, the other Jabir. Their trade was making swords, but they also could read the scriptures in their own tongue. The messenger of Allah used to pass by them and listen to their reading. So your own Muslim sources say, Muhammad learned from Christians, he would hear them read, and they would expound to him the stories of, <clears throat> of the Jews and the Christians. So no, you're wrong. He didn't need to read. He could hear, and that's how he learned. So that doesn't prove he's a prophet. So, uh, Abdullah, we said we were giving you the last word, but then you 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 had also said that you, you know you you were doing this to to learn, and that you wanted to continue your research. So we wanted to give you at least a general idea of our thoughts on those. Now you definitely get the last word. Any final thoughts you want to share with anyone, even if we completely disagree with you? Okay. <laughs> you get the last word here. Go ahead. No, I think I think it was um, very nice of you to at least give him because the more you tell me about this, the more I'll research. And uh, I'm a type of person who always likes to research. I am not a type of person who likes to stay in his bubble. So obviously, there are a lot of things that we need to uh, research. Okay, um, number one, I think you said that. Um, uh, so in Islam, we say that the only way a person gets hold of shaitan is is when he. Uh, prostrates or literally gives up to a uh, Satan. So the problem is that the Holy, Pro uh, the Holy Quran was against Satan himself and the Holy Prophet again and again had advised people to stay away from Satan. Um, understand this that um, even though um, 
refuted to my claims of him being an illiterate by saying uh, that he could um uh, he uh, there are some sources that he would go to the uh, christians and so firstly i would like to say that it was um, i mean it, it was not only christians right the quran mentions a lot of different things so even if we even just for the sake of argument if we take all of the things that even um, prophet muhammad uh, which we don't think he did took all the knowledge from somewhere else what type of a writer produces his first book as good as the quran like it, it was as good as because like the person yesterday he told you about surah ayatul kursi and you were like yeah maybe that's uh, not written by a human so what type of a writer is so good at writing i think muhammad uh, sallallahu alaihi wasallam if he wrote it himself nauzubillah then he was uh, one of the most intellectual and competent human being there has to be ever and there has ever lived and moreover you talked about the death i've heard about his uh, death on your channel a lot of times that you would link uh, a verse of the quran and say that he died uh, because of poison the problem is that like um, i was mentioning um, we muslims uh, understand the, and we um, we think that the uh, uh, poison that was given to prophet muhammad in mutton 4 years ago is death Uh, basically when he was eating that some of his other sahabas ate that and uh, companions ate that and he died but when prophet muhammad was dying he uh, tasted a little of it and then he immediately said that i don't want to eat it and therefore um, the poison did go inside but it did not affect until his death that that is because we believe that god wanted to give him the um status of a martyr and therefore um, i think everything is fine um i think um you like you said that there were other movements which are moving rapidly but understand um what i'm trying to say is that even if other movements are uh, growing rapidly they're not growing as rapidly as the um uh, religion of prophet muhammad and the other point which i'm going to stick with is that even we say that he didn't know most of the things and god revealed it to him but even if we say for your sake that he um uh, did uh, get these uh, learn these things from somewhere else then what type of writer produces such a perfectly written i mean grammatically perfectly written book in his first uh try and at the end i just like to finish with um a few uh, a few verses uh, from the uh, from my salah um alhamdulillahi rabbil alamin ar rahman ar rahim maliki yawmiddin iyyaka na'budu wa iyyaka nasta'in ihdinas siratal mustaqim siratal ladzina an'amta 'alaihim ghairil maghdubi 'alaihim walad dhalin amin um praise be to the lord um, allah who created all words allahumma salli ala muhammadin wa ala ali muhammadin and also um may god bless his uh, 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 may go uh, may peace be upon um, muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam that's all from my side thank you mm-hmm. all right uh thanks to uh sam for joining us so many times and yeah, my uh, pleasure bro special thanks to hamdullah for uh being i didn't know i didn't know you <laughs> I don't know you're 16 years old when you asked uh, when you said uh you wanted to join us but uh thank you for the discussion and uh I I just want to say it's great that there are 16 year olds who are looking into the stuff again again whether you're whether you're Christian or Muslim or whatever it's good to have people in their you know in their teens when you know lots of other kids are just spending all their time playing video games but uh it's good to see teenagers who are looking into these kinds of matters and we just encourage our friend uh Hamdola to continue continue studying and uh, if you ever want to talk about something else uh feel yep, free to f- feel free to get in touch with us all right thanks everyone for joining us Real quickly hey let me let him know in half an hour after this that former muslim who became a christian is going to be on my live stream cuz he has questions about the trinity and response to muslims so in half an hour join me he's got some excellent questions christ is risen jesus is lord to the glory of god the father amen pray for us and um Yeah, uh j- just in case for anyone who doesn't have Sam's channel it's Shamunian and right after we're done I will add the link in the description box. So if you come back and if you don't have the link you I mean I'm sure you guys do but if you don't I'll add it to the description box and you can just click on it. All right. Catch y'all later.